Matt, is it true you are doing a stand-up show in Perth? That is true, Dave. How did you know? I was telling you just before, but it's on <laughs> uh, in Perth, Australia. It's Western Australia. So excited to be getting back over there for the first time in a little while. People can get tickets via mattstewartcomedy.com. And if they use the discount code, do go on, they'll get a discount. Ooh. Yeah. Is it a code? Yeah, that's the code. Oh, okay. Do go on. Hey, if you're in Melbourne, we're also doing a live show at the Great Australian Podcast Festival Saturday, November the 6th at the Palais Theatre. We'd love to see you there. Tickets are available now and uh, find the link in the description of this episode. Palais, where I saw Kiss. (laughs) Up close and personal. Welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnicke, and as always, I'm here with Matt Stewart. Hey, Dave. How good is it to be here? It is great to be here with you. And also, a very special guest is joining us this week. It's Claire Tonti. Hello. I'm here. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for being here, stepping into Jess's big shoes. They're so big. Like, probably not that big. Oh, no, surprisingly, they are so yeah. big. <laughs> how big are her feet? Like size... Clown feet. 11. Is that yeah, big? Yeah, yeah. Whoa. Well, try and push Did her over. You, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried. Thank you to the ground. <laughs> if, I, if there's nothing I know about Jess is that she's very stable. Very stable. I, we've yeah. even done the thing where I, like, get down on or falls behind her and Matt pushes her over my back. <laughs> and I just got injured. She, she just bounces back. <laughs> yeah. Sturdy Perkins, we call her. <laughs> Sturdy Perkins. My favourite kind of Perkins. Well, those are big shoes to fill, but I'm here to give them a burl. Well, thank you give so much for giving girl. it a burl. You're welcome. Oh, let's just uh, feel in there. Is that is that your big toe there? <laughs> feeling that? <laughs> feeling feeling that? that? Wiggle it for me. Yeah. Wiggle it. <laughs> oh, no. Nah, I reckon what you'll need to do is wear thick socks with this one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's their answer to everything. She sells people. Oh, you're growing to those. Yeah, growing I'm 26. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty young, though. <laughs> you're still growing. <laughs> I always had those slidey things. You know the metal things where they slide oh, and measure your feet? Oh, so cold. Oh, though. I mean cold. That's what I meant. <laughs> oh. Fun. <laughs> They're so yeah, fun. Look at them. Yeah, love, love that. Love that. Figuring out foot data right now. Amazing. It's like being in a science lab <laughs> for your feet. <laughs> but you're you're kind of here. You're doing a, a bit of a book tour at the moment, or a pod tour, I suppose, because you're you just released a brand new podcast series called Tonts. Certainly have. I know, and it's, it's about actually, tonts. Yeah. Tonsillitis? It is. It's yeah. a podcast all about tonsillitis. 600 Definitely. episodes. It's a deep dive, a real deep dive. 600 episodes on your mouth. Um, yeah, no, it's called Tonts. It's really fun to say the word tonts. 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 Yeah, anyway, it's, uh, it's an interview <laughs> like it. show. <laughs> Thanks. It's an interview show and it's about your inner critic and kind of your inner voice and mental health and I'm interviewing lots of different people who've made things or done things or been through things to kind of help us through this time because I feel like it's such a weird time, right, at the moment we're living through and mental health is obviously really important. Mm. Yeah, so that's kind of what the show's about. And yeah. uh, you've had Big Shoe, Bigfoot Jess on the and as a guest, I believe. I have. She was on my sec- yeah third episode, and a lot of it is also to do with um, like the TV and films that we watch as well, and those stories as kids that we absorbed, and then what that kind of ma- how that manifests as we get older. And so Jess and I deep dive into a lot of stuff, um, including the Avengers movies and how much we love them and then and how different it is now to the films that we got to watch as kids that were like The Little Mermaid and like really bullshit movies where girls just kind of like lost their voice and <laughs> had to change their whole life in order to marry Prince Eric and all that kind of stuff. So there's a bit of rage <laughs> in the show as well. <laughs> Prince Eric. a lot Eric. of rage, yeah. actually. I don't remember Prince Eric. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was hot. Oh, he was he? one of the hot ones. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. Eric is hot? <laughs> <laughs> is that possible? Well, it is a fairy tale. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, him, Aladdin. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm yeah, on board with that. Animation no world. That. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Exactly. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of what we examined. Actually, I did an episode recently called, on coming to America with a comedian called Zainab Johnson, who was here in the Melbourne Comedy Festival um, a couple of years ago, back when we could do comedy festivals. And, um, yeah, we just talk about how awesome that movie is and then also how problematic and why she she loves it still. And yeah, so it's been a really fun show. I'm really enjoying doing it. So it's called Tons and it's out now on all your favourite podcast apps. It certainly is. It's out on all your poto apps. So I would love you to go and check it out. But you're not just here to plug 
uh, your fantastic new podcast program. Oh, yes. No, I am. I'm only. I'm leaving oh. now. Oh, yeah. That's it. That's oh, the no. only reason I was here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a short episode, mate. Correct. Well, while you're here, would it be possible to get you to tell us a report on a, on a certain topic? <laughs> I mean, it's Straight from the it. top well, of your dome. It's a bit of a yeah. stretch. Just a bit of a stretch there, Matthew. But I, I guess I could pull this giant novel out of my handbag. That would be fantastic. <laughs> and while you do that, uh, maybe Dave can explain to you and any new listeners what this show is all about. Yes, Claire, I probably should have taken the time to tell you this earlier, but what we do here is we take it in turns to report on a topic, uh, often suggested by a listener, go away, do a bit of research, bring it back, and uh, you're the person who's done the research. Correct. Matt and I don't know what you've researched. And, and as you said, you have pulled out a novel here. You, this is the first ever report given <laughs> on the show that has been printed out in hard copy. Yeah, and, and also got, had been published yeah, by Simon & Schuster. <laughs> that's right. So got a can, deal. That'll be available at uh, Dimmix <laughs> uh, this week if you want to read along at home. Um, but we often start with a question. All right. Are you ready for my question? So ready. I'm so excited about this. I'm such a massive fan of this show. It's real good. If this is your first episode, what are you doing? It's like 300 <laughs> other episodes. Go back and listen. Okay, so question. What TV show is responsible for inspiring a global cupcake craze that culminated in the Manhattan cupcake shop Magnolia Bakery needing to employ a full-time bouncer? Whoa. <laughs> that is, that's a lot of uh, Power Rangers. <laughs> I'm trying, I can't think of, there's all these, like, it'd be great, fr- great British Bake Off. Great Australian Bake Off. Ooh. Great Canadian Bake Off. Oh, great oh, you're a bit Manhattan Bake Off. Is it a Bake Off show? No. Okay. It, okay. I'll give you a clue. It's set in Manhattan. Oh, Sex and, and the City. Yes! He's got <laughs> Wait, Sex <laughs> and the City. Sex. In yes. the city? In and out of the city. Okay. In and out and in again. <laughs> and out again. <laughs> Claire, Tonti, please. <laughs> Look, I'm setting the tone for the whole episode. Oh God, this is a family-friendly program, please. <laughs> so, so is this sorry. this has been so inspired because it's just been uh, it's just coming back for a, like yes. A, there's a new movie, the third movie called "And Just Like That," that's coming out. Is soon. it called it's, "Sex in the City"? Dot dot dot. And just like that, or no, it's just called oh. "Just Like That." Because that's what Carrie, the one of the lead characters, would always say. Have you seen any of "Sex in the City"? Actually? I saw. Uh, the first film when I was in EOS in the Greek Islands, I was staying at this, par- <laughs> at this party resort thing, and they had like by the pool they had a big screen. They do a movie each night, and right near the screen is where they, you could charge your phones. There was power there, <laughs> so I I so said I'll, I'll go look after our group's phones while they charge. And mm-hmm. I'd never seen Sex and the City before, and they're like, yeah, just we'll charge for half an hour, then we'll catch the bus into town, hit the clubs and stuff. I'm like no worries. They come back half an hour later. And I've got my my head resting on my chin, looking up <laughs> with big eyes. Just at the enthralled, screen. enthralled. And um, my mates still talk about they're like, we could not pull your. I I'd said to him, I'll meet you later. I'm gonna watch the end of the Sex in the City film. <laughs> So yeah, I've got a little connection to the. You got a soft spot. Wow, you know, and so and you in a, are you in the water watching? No, I was well. I couldn't be because I was up near the powerpoints. Um, Charging the I mean, phone. the people who were really enjoying themselves were floating on the, floating around. the pool. Watching. Um, yeah. But, I mean, they weren't giving it enough no. attention for and, me. And you've seen the movie, but not the series. Yeah, was it the movie the good? Because I, I don't know why, but it really you sucked me it. in. Because <laughs> really? I've, I've heard since that it's awful. No, the second movie oh, is the awful. Second is and awful. diehard fans really don't like want that to be in the canon at all. Because <laughs> oh, it's like <laughs> super racist. Okay. Oh my awful. goodness. Yeah. The more recent one is the racist one. Yeah, yeah. There was, so Sex and the wow. City 1 is actually not too bad. Like it, it did really well in the box office and fans generally loved it. But the second one was so bad. It was set half in Dubai and at one point the lead character Samantha just stands in the middle of like the the town square throwing condoms in the air and like celebrating the fact that she's American and free to have sex wherever she wants. It's right. really no like... wonder you were enthralled, Matt. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love a dinger shower. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's famously so bad that I pretend to myself because I'm a massive Sex and City fan. I, but, uh, it doesn't exist. I it's love doesn't exist. that there's a sort of a Star Wars like fandom who have has canon. They say things like canon yeah. and <laughs> that things should not be canon. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, shall we get to the report? Yeah, Sex and the City. Uh, just quickly, Gentlemen. I have very little knowledge of the Sex and the City world. Oh, you're I such a Samantha. Yeah. <laughs> 
Jonathan. One thing that I would love you to do, Claire, and maybe you get to this, is I would love you to explain what that means. <laughs> when people say, oh, you're such a insert ca- I'd love to know the traits of each character. I don't understand when people say, oh, you're, All such, right. you're such a blah, blah. All right, okay. What does that mean? Okay, we will get to it. We will get Thank to you. it. I need to set the scene first. So I will say as well that the movies are not really the heart of the show. Okay. They're just like added extra icing on top and the bulk of it is the episode, like the seasons of the show Okay. as diehard fans. So we're going to start right back at the very beginning. Um, so you don't know anything about it, really? No, really no. Saying. I know uh, like two of the characters' names and Mr. Big. Uh, I was going to say Mr. Big. Uh, Mr. Big. And the guy from, uh, what was that, Alaska show from uh, North, Northern Exposure? Northern Exposure. The Northern Exposure oh. DJ was a... In it at one point. Oh, I didn't know that. Who's oh, also in My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Oh, Aiden Shaw. Yes, he's excellent. <laughs> there you he go. He's like, yeah, he's amazing. All right, okay, so let's start at the very beginning. So imagine Candace Bushnell is a writer eking out an existence, getting by, living in a friend's 10th story apartment on 79th Street in Manhattan and writing for various newspapers and magazines for no money on an old Dell laptop. The phone rings one day. And it was Peter Kaplan, editor of The Observer, asking if she'd like to turn her sporadic reports on New York glamour nightlife into a regular column at $1,000 a pop. This is in the 90s. so That's, I mean, I'd good. take that today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Me obviously. <laughs> yeah. US? <laughs> Imagine. It's pretty bloody Set it good. like that's a bit of a revelation. Yeah, I would take that's pretty good week. money for a, writing a column. <laughs> for writing a column all about you going out drinking every night. <laughs> Sounds pretty good, right? Cosmos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for all, you know, heaps about yeah. it. I'd love I if love you. I love Cosmos. Well, I don't know. You probably haven't <laughs> noticed it, but not too far from the studio here, there's a laundromat called Soap in the City, and it's got a <laughs> oh. Cosmo. In, it's all uh, Sex in the City design. I, oh I don't know God. how much they're paying for the rights wow. to that. But no, yeah. That is where I'm going immediately. <laughs> I have no washing, but I will take this job and put it right in that laundry. That's where we should get it. Thing. We should take the photo down there after the show. <laughs> Do they we should initially actually. call it Sex in the Soap? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know about this. Sex in the Soapy. <laughs> soapy Sex in the City. Woo. Clean. All right. So um, Candace entitled the column Sex in the City. As a nod to Helen Gurley Brown's bestseller, Sex and the Single Gal, a perfect topic for the time. So, can... So, this was... So, wow, okay. So, it's based on a real column. Mm, it's based on a real column. Yes, correct. I didn't know that. That's into a book. Yeah, so... Um, just as a side note, Candace grew up in the 1960s dreaming of becoming a writer from the age of eight. She grew up with no brothers in a world that was super sexist, and the message she got from a very young age was that boys are better than girls, which, as we know, isn't true. As a feminist. We're way better. As a feminist. <laughs> as a feminist. I will, as the I'll feminist. Take a, sorry, Claire, I'll take this one. Um, <laughs> as the feminist, I will say. Good. Yeah, good. girl power. Mate. You know, I'll we'll say uh, solidarity. Lean in. Um, <laughs> lean out if you want. <laughs> lean out up to you. <laughs> lean in or out. It's actually, thanks, Matt, for mad splaining all over my report. Sorry, no, Claire. No, I we finished need- there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I respect you as an ally. Thank you, my friend. So, anyway, back to it. So, this is where the seeds of her feminism were firmly planted. Fast forward to America in the 1980s, where a cultural shift was taking place. Young women were moving into the cities and entering into the workforce in droves. The 1920s was another time of social change just like this. Um, And in the 80s, it was the first time for many that they were able to rewrite the script of their own lives. And this is Candace's quote, to find a better life and a bigger love. Oh, oh cool. Mr. Big. Oh, Mr. Big. Ho, ho. Candace says it was also a time, hold on to your hats, when women were finally allowed to talk about the big O. What could that be? Ovaries. Oh. Definitely. They were all talking about their big ovaries. <laughs> <laughs> Comparing them. Mine's the biggest. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we don't see needed an X-ray machine. Just, <laughs> just doing the bar, everyone's X-raying their ovaries and comparing them. <laughs> Everyone wants the biggest one. Okay, no, it was orgasm. The big orga- orgasm. So a new... <laughs> Everyone was comparing each other's. Yeah. I've got the biggest orgasm. <laughs> I have the biggest one. You're telling me Correct. the big O is not Roy Orbison. <laughs> but I've been saying it wrong this whole time. Uh, the big O is actually uh, 90s racehorse octagonal. <laughs> Jeez, there's been there's been a lot of big O's. A lot of big O's. So many big O's. The big orange. Oh. Is that a thing? Yeah, oh yeah. There's a couple of big oranges. I think there's yeah. one in Mildura. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah, you've just been from We're big fans of the big things. Oh, we love it. The bigger the better. The bigger the orgasm, the better. Yeah, correct. Okay, back to the story. So a new sexual freedom had begun. In the 80s, the idea of the single woman, woman, I can't say that word, woman, was a new concept. So they just hadn't heard of it before. There was, you know, that vibe of like the single girl. No, apparently not. All the dating rules because of that had to be written in the culture. So, for example, how many dates do you go on before you sleep with a guy? Or how can you tell if a guy is a player versus a guy that wants to settle down? They were the big questions Candace answered in her column. Okay, what, what did she say? <laughs> Do they wear a certain coloured hat? Or? <laughs> Players like to carry around big oranges. Okay. <laughs> that's right. how you know. That's the giveaway. That's how you know, exactly. Um, everything had changed. And the one thing that was common, was common, which I know a lot of single women still talk about today, was that there was a feeling that there were all these eligible women in their late 20s, early 30s, and no great single men. So Candace quickly grew a, ke- grew a keen following for her juicy gossip column as she wrote about the wealthy Manhattan socialites around her and their love lives, sexual politics and her own tumultuous relationship with the real life Mr. Big Orange, <laughs> Mr. Big, <laughs> who was actually, he's actually a real person, called the Vogue publisher Ron Galotti. Ooh. Mm, so she wrote really candidly, cand- candidly? Candidly. 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 Candidly, with pseudonyms, of course, about the different types of men and women she met and their issues with razor sharp wit and comic timing. She had a real knack for getting people to open about up about their private lives and loves. Oh. Yeah, so people would love to read her column and then guess who she was really talking about. So it was very juicy and, like, salacious. Um, so then, enter Darren Starr. Have you heard about Darren Starr before? I don't know. Ah, so Darren Starr um, is a TV producer who met Candace when she profiled him for Vogue magazine and the two became fast friends. He would go with her on nights out through the city where they'd get super drunk with the extremely rich real Mr Big, bar hopping and partying all through dark bars in New York, Um, Darren hailed Candace as a 90s Dorothy Parker. Now, just as a side note, Darren Starr produced Marrow's Place and Beverly Hills 90210. So he's like a really big TV Got some runs on the board, yeah. Mr. Big. Yeah. This is good because I had been picturing the 90s uh, rock ballad band Mr. Big, (laughs) who I once bought their greatest hits album called Big Bigger Biggest. (laughs) And yes, it did just have their one hit. <laughs> Which was? <laughs> Which was, I'm the one who wants to be with you. Oh, yeah. Oh. I don't know what it's, it might be called to be with to you. Be with you know when a, when a Greatest Hits has a Cat Stevens cover? They're really filling it out. <laughs> <laughs> biggest Big, hit. Bigger, biggest. <laughs> Great name for it. I found the photo of the real Mr. Big with the guy who played Mr. Big. Yeah, he's, he's uh, bald and not as good looking, right? Well, I mean, as Chris you Noth. know, That's you Chris Hollywoodify Noth. him a little bit, don't right. you? Right, yeah, you got to. You know Chris North, side note, is a slob in real life and hates the fact that he had to play Mr Big. Like, he hated being the character. He thought the really? whole show was, like, really fussy and annoying and he hated the fashion <laughs> and he hates that women still come up to him and talk to him about it. And that no matter what he does, he can't shake the fact that he's Mr Big because he oh, has to, like, avoid going to places. would be frustrating. Surely people now remember him as uh, the husband husband of the good wife. Surely, but no. Yeah. Who is pretty much the same guy, I think. Yeah, exactly. Or he's also in Law and Order as I, I, well. I was going to say, you showed me that photo and I thought, why are you showing me a photo of that guy from Law and Order? Yeah. <laughs> That's Mr. Really... Big, Dave. Yeah. There you go. I'm the one who wants to be with you. Yeah, correct. What? Exactly. Do you know what? He's one of the first examples of a man being objectified in a show and usually it's like, like the other way around. And he hated it. And so he there you absolutely go. hated it. Yeah, correct. Exactly. Anyway, we'll get back to him later. So was that, that was like a choice to like making a feminist point was it to objectify a man in a show? Well, kind of. I think it's just how it happened, right. really, because really women are usually always the eye candy, right? And not that the women aren't gorgeous in this show, mm. but it's just interesting because he actually doesn't have a lot of lines in the show and he had to really fight. He does have some comics like lines in the show, but he had to really fight for them because he didn't want the, the guy to be one-dimensional, right. which is kind of really interesting. Are you saying that two wrongs make a right here? Yeah. Correct. Yes. <laughs> boys, girls are better than boys. I'm all for the vengeance because of my big ovaries. <laughs> hey, let's not uh, put a, you know, let's not get them, Just take measures a... out, Claire, because <laughs> Dave and I don't have a lot to 
<laughs> contribute. Contribute. No, I'll speak my for yourself. ovaries are bigger than yours. Oh, there you go. My ovaries are bigger than yours. Anyway, um, back to it. So Darren Starr um, is not Mr. Big. That's Ron Galotti. He was the publisher of Vogue. So Darren Starr is the TV producer who was friends with Candace, who's also gay. And um, he hailed Candace as a 90s Dorothy Parker. Now, Dorothy. What? Oh, okay. <laughs> I was about to say, you said Dorothy Parker before as well, and, and it sounded like you thought we'd know who that is. But you were just about to explain. <laughs> who are you? Well, I'm glad I interrupted this. <laughs> Correct. I literally, I put all back up I was like, they're not going to know who that is. It sounds like I should know, but I keep thinking Dorothy from Wizard of Oz, oh. and that's probably not her. And also Georgie Parker. <laughs> or, or Sarah Jessica Parker, oh who's my like God. the main star of the show. Yeah, okay. Anyway, correct. Well, let me enlighten you. So... Dorothy Parker was born in 1893 and lived and died in 1967. So she was an American poet, writer, critic and satirist based in New York. She was best known for her wit, wisecracks and eye for 20th century urban foibles. Oh, I love, love that word. I love foibles. Great word. I love, I love everything about it. Uh, Parker became famous for her short, viciously humorous poems in the New Yorker, many highlighting ludicrous aspects of her many largely unsuccessful romantic affairs. So basically she was like... The nine, the eighteen sort of what is it? Early nineteen hundreds version of Candace Bushnell. Ah, cool. Yeah, she eventually travelled to Hollywood to pursue screenwriting and received two Academy Award nominations before being curtailed because of her involvement in left wing politics, and she was blacklisted. Oh in no! Exactly because it was so unusual at that time for women to write anything or do anything <laughs> or be funny or anything. Were they like woman writer? <laughs> Communist. <laughs> yes, yes, genuinely, exactly. So witty and full of wisecracks, Dorothy was known for her zingers, including this one. When famously taciturn former US President Calvin Coolidge died, do we know who that is? I know, it's no by name. <laughs> yeah. Correct. He was very serious, apparently, and boring. Parker remarked, when he died, Parker remarked, how could they tell? <laughs> <laughs> That's a zinger. Zinger. That's a Got him. Zinger. Got him, Dorothy. Good old Dorothy. the book chick, Dave. Dave Clay might not know this, but he has a very successful book related <laughs> podcast called Stop book, It. The Book Chook the and book Friends. Chook. The Book Chook. Have you heard of Dorothy Parker? Uh, yes, I've heard of her. I knew she was a writer, but that was about it. I didn't know that. You didn't she, know she was a zing merchant. I didn't know she, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that she was the queen of steam. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you know. Happy to help. All right. Anyway, back to. S-A-T-C, as I like to call it, Sex and the City. <laughs> like I had to check your notes there. <laughs> I was like, oh, God, did I say the wrong letters? As soon as you looked at your notes, all confidence uh, ev- evaporated from me. Yeah. Like, Claire, does she know what she's talking about, Claire? <laughs> never. I never know. Anyway, eventually Candace turned her columns into a best-selling book, weaving stories of living as a single gal in Manhattan, sexual polit- politics and her on and off again r- romance with Ron Galotti. And Which it is, became by the way, Hit. What a name, Ron Galotti. Mm. Oh, Ron. We love good names on this show, and that's oh. that's got to be in the top 100 or so, I reckon. Yeah, it's Absolutely. pretty good. Ron Galotti. Ron right. Galotti. And does he realise that she's writing about him? Does he have any issue oh, with yeah. that? He oh, yeah. He totally knows. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because everyone's reading the column at the time, and they're all living in New York and boozing and sleeping with everybody, and so he's writing. Yeah, so. And she refers to him as Mr. Big in the column? Mm-hmm. Ah, oh, that's yeah. so fun. Is it or is it? <laughs> it's fun. I think it's fun. fun. I think you wouldn't want to be called Mr. Small. Yeah. Right? Oh, and is it? It's about his dick, is it? <laughs> Is that, yeah, is, that, is, that what, is that what it is? Is that what no. we're talking about? No, it's ovaries. not. No. Oh. Oh, no, it's about his ovaries. No, I think it's actually about his stature because he's extremely wealthy. He's right. like, he actually was modelled on Donald Trump. He's that right. kind of it. Like, so Mr. Big have, Shot. He's, yeah, Mr. Big Shot. Like he's compar- compared to Donald Trump. Donald Trump. And it, he's kind of like an enigma. He's stringing her along. She's always kind of in love with him, but he she can never know exactly how he feels about her. And he's always like flying her in private jets and going off to the Hamptons to his fancy beach houses. And yeah, so he's a big shot. In 1997, Darren Starr asked Candace if he could adapt her book Sex in the City into a TV series. At that time, American TV was going through a sexual revolution. With shows like Melrose Place and 90210, things were becoming a bit more racy on screen. How racy was that theme song? I forget which one it was, but it goes... Da-na-na-na, da-na-na-na. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> da-na-na-na. Da-na-na-na. <laughs> 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 was that Melrose Place or Beverly Hills? I don't know. 
I feel like was it Melrose Place? Maybe it was Melrose Place. No, I don't know. But <laughs> yeah, anyway. the Smash Mouth yeah. is so good. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's like here they are. <laughs> oh, it was the age of the wild guitar back then? Yeah, it really was, wasn't it? Um, all right, so Darren Starr had already garnered success for, as we said, shows like Melrose Place and Beverly Hills that were smart, slick, and juicy, and so I can't like a big it. orange. <laughs> That's how he pitched it. <laughs> Imagine an orange. Oh, imagine a big I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> how much you want, Star? Oh, God. Anyway, so he saw Sex in the City as a more of a risky artistic project um, because it was going to be, it needed to be highly explicit, um, which is why he pitched it to HBO. And I thought, thought this was interesting. HBO was a cable network, so not free to air. And it was mainly famous for sports and fighting, oh. like all the fighting, all the boxing. But they had very little else on there at the time. And because we now we know it is like synonymous with shows like Game of Thrones and like yeah you the know, golden made, age of TV correct yeah. Sopranos it, yeah, like yeah yeah and so one of the reasons I think that happened was because they decided to go with a strategy to get good producers and TV runners and writers um, from you know the net like the free to air networks to come across to them they said they could make edgier shows because they'd have freedom to do whatever they liked um, and that's how they managed to attract Darren Star to HBO and how he managed to get Sex and the City made because it's an R-rated one-camera show, which at the time was unheard of. So, so much about this show was, like, groundbreaking. Yeah, right. I, yeah, I assumed it was, like, an NBC show or something. No, no. And so th- this was the first kind of TV series like this that HBO produced. And it's probably since then it's changed the kind of TV that the commercial networks make or whatever they call the free-to-air networks make, maybe. Because it... Yeah, because yeah. it just seems like it's a mainstream show now, but at the time it was kind of groundbreaking. Yeah, completely, and definitely not mainstream at all. Like You think it was sort of just after Seinfeld had become like a massive smash hit on free-to-air, um, and that's that's like a four-camera sitcom. So it like with the laughter tracks and all of the stuff. Not that or those. Do they have a live studio audience? I think they had a live Seinfeld? audience. Yeah. So it was and Friends as well. All of those kind of sitcoms. So Sex in the City was done completely differently. Um, Darren Star wanted to make it. Um, from a female point of view, which was also revolutionary at the time. Um, And there were very few shows starring a whole cast of women, especially women in their 30s, and it's still actually quite rare for shows like that to have four lead characters that are all women. Yeah, it was amazing, though. It still never passed the bechamel test. That's the cheese test. The bechamel cheese sauce (laughs) test. The bechdel. The bechdel Bechdel. test. (laughs) Matt, Jesus. I thought you were an ally. That's it. I'm leaving. (laughs) <laughs> the Zoe Deschanel test. No, <laughs> the lasagna test. Every oh. scene, I was still talking about Mr. Big, so I never passed it. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right; it didn't has it still hasn't. So there's, to be fair, as a total caveat, there's a lot of problematic stuff about Sex in the City. Like it is now thought of as problematic in a lot of ways, in that there's like no diversity in the cast. It's very hetero. Oh. Well, um, you've come to the right place because what we like to do here is judge things from the past on today's standards. So, <laughs> so You've come to the right place. Excellent. That Get the red texture out, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I never put the cap back on here. <laughs> Perfect. Excellent. All right. So though Bushnell's column was a collection of sh- snapshots of her life in New York City, Star's idea was to turn it into a story about four women who were friends. Carrie as a columnist in New York, who was the main protagonist based loosely on Bushnell herself, he wanted an every woman who would then have three friends she would go to for advice and inspiration for her writing. The characters needed to be distinct archetypes and were taken from Star's own life. The sexually free and confident career woman in Samantha, which I think would be Matt Stewart. <laughs> okay, well, you can, yeah, well, the three of us plus Jess. First, Dave, you can, or Claire, if you give us mm. each one, and then Dave, you do the Ninja Turtles, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we, Dave likes to do that whenever we have a foursome. Uh, we, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but which one is <laughs> cool but rude? <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. So the sexually free and confident career woman in Samantha, so she's the one that um, is a PR exec and really <laughs> exec, really ambitious and just has lots of sex and, with everybody. And that's... Oh, okay, yeah, that's me. That's definitely Matt, yeah. I'm definitely (laughs) (laughs) career-minded. The cynical and uptight high-flying lawyer in Miranda who's very dry-witted and sarcastic and the more traditional conservative looking for marriage and a family, Charlotte. 
Um, his idea was that each episode, Carrie would ask a question in her column that would then be explored in her own life and in the lives of her three friends. He wanted them, the women to have debate and differences of opinion on everything from their sex lives to career and to love. Each episode would have a theme or question that was then explored. Makes sense? That makes sense. So we've got makes Carrie sense. is obviously Leonardo. Yeah. <laughs> The leader of the group. Yeah. Yeah, she's the leader she's of the group. She's the leader. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Then who's the, who would be the, Samantha's the party dude. She's Michelangelo. Yeah, definitely. Party dude. Then so what, Sh- what Charlotte's a family minded, maybe uh, a bit more sensible, like Donatello, Donatello maybe. Donatello, yeah. He does Correct. machines. Yeah. And then is there a, the cool but rude? They do yeah, a lot of machines the, in this show as well. Yeah. 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 So Miranda. <laughs> Charlotte is, does machines. <laughs> <laughs> Miranda is quite rude in some ways. Like she's, yeah, she's, and she's very red-head. direct and honest. Yeah. Very direct, very closed emotionally. Quite cynical, very funny. Okay, yeah, yeah that's that's, a, that's cool, but rude. Yeah, and, he, and he's the yeah. red Ninja Turtle too, so that oh, winds up perfectly. Perfect, exactly. <laughs> Mate, are you sure they didn't just <laughs> <laughs> rip off? What a rip off! <laughs> that's just later in my report. <laughs> they live in a pages. sewer. <laughs> 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 They're trained by a rat. This yeah. was, wasn't based on Candace Bushnell at all. It was based on the Ninja Turtles. They love to eat pizza. They live in New York. <gasps> oh my god! They have a friend who's a rat. <laughs> Mr. Big Sh- yeah. Shredder. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Correct. How do you get big? You shred. <laughs> that was a genius. I really enjoyed that, Dave. Well done. Thank you. That's There's a reason you're a comedian. <laughs> All right. I can't do anything else. <laughs> That's the reason. <laughs> hey, everyone. Just going to let you know that this week's episode is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Now, question here, Matt. Did you ever read the fine print that appears when you start browsing in incognito mode? No. Well, it says that your activity might still be visible to your employer, your school, huh? Your school, Matt. Oh, no. Or, or your internet service provider. How can they even call it incognito? They that, really shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah, that's a real con. Hmm. Incognito. <laughs> yeah. Incognito. <laughs> and it's not neato as far as I'm concerned. No, unneato. To really stop people from seeing the sites you visit, you need to do what I do and what you do, Matt, and use ExpressVPN. Oh, I've been all over it. The last couple of years, I've. I've had an Express VPN on all my devices, loving it. Genuine incognito, you know what I mean? Yeah, proper. Like, think about all the times you've used Wi Fi at a coffee shop, Dave. We were doing it just before. Or yeah, we like, were. Or, at, you know, a friend's house, parent's house, or, you know, a hotel, whatever. Without Express VPN, every site you visit could be logged by the admin of that network. Like your dad. <laughs> oh, no, dadmin. <laughs> and that's still true even when you're in incognito mode. Uh, so do you really want your dad to see what you've been up to? No, I went through a real spate of, uh, I went through a lot of Sex and the City style Cosmo quizzes to find out what kind of lover I am. Yeah. You and don't I, want the feds to be checking that out, do yeah, you? Or my dad. <laughs> no. You want him to find out when the time's right. Yeah, that's right. I, don't, I want to remain a mystery to both my dad <laughs> and the feds. Well, ExpressVPN is an app that encrypts all of your network data and reroutes it through a network of secure servers so that your private online activity stays just that private. Now, I don't fully understand it, but I get the end result. Yes. Well, that's the thing. I don't understand it either, but we don't have to because it's literally an app with one button. You install it on your browser or on your phone. You click one button, and then you are secure and away from prying eyes. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> Perf. Perf. <laughs> so stop letting strangers and my dad invade your online privacy. Protect yourself at expressvpn.com slash do go on. That's right. Use our link at expressvpn.com slash do go on and you'll get three months extra for free. Let me just spell it out for you. That is expressvpn.com slash do go on to learn more and get yourself three months extra for free. All right, back to it. So many of the themes and character stereotypes came from Candice Bushnell's original column. So this is every episode had like a question that would then be answered or explored or a theme. So the questions were things like, should you settle for what you can get? What are the breakup rules? Can you be friends with an ex? Is there really such a thing as the one? Is monogamy in New York too much to expect? Is there such a thing as the one? What do we think? Who knows? So how do they bring up the question? Like, is it like... So explicit that that's the column that week or do they 
that's just the overarching theme and they just talk about that for the episode type thing. So Carrie, it's all in Carrie's head. So Carrie always famously has like her laptop open in her New York brownstone apartment and she's always smoking a cigarette in the early episodes and she's typing away. On a always like cheap Dell. On a, yeah. No, no, she has an apple in this one, I think. Anyway, she's typing away and she's always like, could it be that monogamy is dead in New York City? Uh, I pose the question, will we ever find love? And then the episode kind of starts. Wow. So it's narrated in her voice, if there that must, makes sense. And that, that lasted the whole way through, mm. and there were hundreds of episodes probably. Yeah. That's he, a lot of questions. So many questions. But I so think many. she did, I mean, they've ripped off both Ninja Turtles and now Doogie Howser, because I'm pretty <laughs> sure <laughs> <laughs> Diary is tripping and tapping on his, <laughs> on his uh, computer at the start and end. Uh, in the first season, actually... She would Carrie would often look at the camera and break the is it the fourth wall the yeah. third wall the fourth wall so and they got rid of that pretty quickly. If she they broke the third annoying. wall as well, then she's really <laughs> creating havoc. She, <laughs> <laughs> she broke all the walls there, big oranges, just throwing them at the walls. Um, yeah, so she would look directly at the camera and sort of say something like, "What, what oh, do you think?" F- her husband famously did that in Ferris Bueller as well. Well, there you go. It must Maybe. be Matthew Broderick. <laughs> Correct. Exactly. She got it from him. Um, you would say that as well. <laughs> yeah, everything so far, I'm like, yeah, I think they got yeah. that from a show that men made. Yeah. <laughs> men did it. yeah, exactly. I mean, this sounds pretty groundbreaking, but not as groundbreaking as the men doing it. It's like, the turtle. It's like they even ripped off four male turtles. <laughs> yeah, correct, exactly. Oh, God, women can't do anything. No, don't quote me on that. So they so they dropped that pretty early on, though, do they? Yeah, after the first season, because they realised it was kind of annoying. And isn't it annoying? When you watch it back now, are you like, what's she doing? Because yeah. it's not really the rest of the show. Yeah, exactly. And also it kind of breaks the mystery of the show. Like it makes you, it takes you out of it. You sort of don't believe the characters as much if someone's constantly <laughs> yeah, You're like, every time you. you're like, wait, is this a TV show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, God. Anyway, so then um, famously um, Carolyn Strauss was a major producer for this show. So she's one of the ones that helped to get the first series greenlit. Um, and she worked for HBO and she's since been involved in the production of just a few little shows like The Sopranos, Whoa. The Wire, <gasps> Curb Your Enthusiasm, Shit. The Great British Bake Off. No, not really. Not that one. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> not that one. No. And most recently, a tiny show you might not have heard of called Game of Thrones. Oh, wow. Yeah. So she is known to be like a like basically a hit maker, and Sex in the City was her first one that she Holy kind of shit. greenlit. Yeah, no one, like nearly no one, would have ever been involved in that many massive blockbuster hits. Probably, what is that? Five of the biggest shows of the last twenty years. Yeah, that's let's amazing. Go with that. I know because women are better. Today. <laughs> no, but it is really amazing. I think that Claire, she managed you to do really that. Sounds like you've got a bit of an agenda here. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do have an agenda. Talk more and more about my big ovaries. <laughs> no, not really. All right, so. She was the executive producer um, and she helped to bring the show in um, and she suggested another writer called um, Michael Patrick King. Now, have you heard of Michael Patrick King? Yeah, he played Doogie Howser. (laughs) (laughs) Nailed it. Exactly. Um, So Michael Patrick King, and I'm just going to turn my page over because I've jumped into him first. Where is he? There he is. Um, he asked to them, to, so Carolyn Strauss had a pilot made with Darren Starr, starring Jessica Parker and um, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Michael Patrick King was asked to take a look at it. So initially he was unattached until the last moment when Carrie turns to Big and says, um, asks if he's, if Big's ever been in love, and he says, absolutely. <laughs> 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 and Carrie is completely thrown. So Ma- Michael Patrick King said in that moment he saw something really special. So he's got an interesting... <laughs> I saw an absolutely bodacious brother. <laughs> nice one, bro. Yeah, correct. Exactly. So he grew up in a very conservative Irish Catholic family where his father delivered coal and beer and his mum worked at Krispy Kreme. Um, but he's always loved language and storytelling. And did, Wait, did you just say his father delivered coal and beer? Yeah. What a combo. I know. Correct. Why would you... I guess because you'd want a fire and yeah. then you'd have a beer with it. Is that yeah. why you'd want to deliver coal back then? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. That sounds right, doesn't it? I don't know. Anyway, so he was Irish um, and he waited tables, worked as a messenger and got a job unloading buses from 5 p.m. to 3 a.m. 
um, before finally making his big break as a stand-up comedian touring the country. He started writing plays and his first one got writing acclaim. He then moved to LA and started writing on Farrah Fawcett's Good Sports and on Murphy Brown and he became SATC's sole showrunner and protector and guardian from that point on. Um, and it's thought that Michael Patrick King kind of brings the depth and emotion to the show and Darren Starr kind of brings the overarching idea, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. And Yeah, okay. So it's starting to sound like a couple of men have been the secret of this success. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> oh, no. There's my theory. Come no, what about that, the that, that producer that produced five of the biggest shows? Correct. Yeah, exactly. And the writer who the whole thing is based on. Yeah, Yeah, Candice Bushnell. And the uh, four leading ladies. Correct. Yeah, exactly. And that's who I'm going to talk about next, Dave, because Sarah Jessica Parker um, is credited with also being a producer because when Darren Starr convinced her to be the lead character, he also asked her to produce the show with him so he could mentor her. And she's credited with a lot of the really iconic attention to detail in the show. Like at one stage she paid for the rain in a scene um, just out of her own pocket because she felt it really needed to be there. That's sort of God level stuff, <laughs> paying for rain. Sorry, it? I was thinking for a second that she decided that the character should pay for rain. And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> Gotcha. She paid for the rain. In the scenes. Behind the scenes, gotcha. Correct. Yeah, yeah, do exactly. You, do you go into Sarah Jessica Parker's uh, at all, her career up to this point? Correct. Oh, you yes. do, great. I'm about Could to I... do it now. <laughs> I'm just I'm gonna stop talking. Oh, no, I'm being really rude. But no, no, no. I just mean because I, every time I ask a question, you're about to answer yeah, it anyway. Yeah. Because I'm like, I don't think I'd heard of her before this show. I was also wondering, was she mm. big big deal before yeah. this? Because she's already getting offered the lead role and pr- producing yeah, that credit. You makes know? it sound like the she mentor. was already yeah. somewhat of a star. Cor- maybe. Well, you would be correct there. Yeah. So she was in Footloose in '84, oh. and she was in Girls Just Want to Have Fun in '85, and then also the first Wives Club in '90. 1996, just before Sex and the City kind of came out. So she wasn't like a giant star, but she was definitely on the map as being like a famous actress. Um, And she, yeah, so because she was like the big movie star at the time um, and the most famous of the cast of women, she also got the biggest contract as well. Right. Which is what has led to some controversy around things later on yeah right. um, okay. yeah so yeah so she was pretty famous um she interestingly didn't think she would suit Carrie at all because Carrie was such um kind of like a brassy character and um smoking and drinking and all that stuff and Sarah Jessica Parker is really known to be quite traditional and super academic and she's been married to Matthew Broderick for over 20 years now and she was just getting married at the time um, that the show was kind of about to launch. So she initially didn't want to do Carrie at all. Who um, G thinks she was? She thought she was more of a Charlotte. Right? Charlotte. <laughs> a Charlotte. I think she just didn't want to be in it at all until she read the script. So her manager. Until she read the line, absolutely. fucking lootly <laughs> Oh, my God. There's something here. Wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so Kevin Huvane, have you ever heard of him? No. Kevin Huvane. So he manages Meryl Streep and J-Lo, among others. So he was her manager at the time and read the script alongside Sarah Jessica Parker and just told her she really needed to do it because it was just so brilliant oh, wow. and different to anything he'd seen before. And interestingly, he grew up in the Bronx and was like um, working at the front desk of the Wyndham Hotel um, and was so well known in New York at that time as being like really lovely and really hardworking, even though he was just kind of working at doing odd jobs in the hotel. He kind of cozied up to all the celebrities. And then there was this story where a well known celebrity's complaint that she brought to him was handled so well in the hotel that William Morris, which was the biggest, fanciest management, management agency, agency in New York City in the 1980s, offered him a job. And that's kind of how he got his break and then ended up managing Sarah Jessica Parker from when she was 19. Wow. And also cool. other superstars. Yeah, like Meryl Streep. It's amazing that you can have that many m- multiple clients. you think that like someone like Meryl Streep and or J-Lo, that'd take up. That's a full-time job yeah. managing them, isn't it? Yeah, you would think so. What a legend. I know, yeah. So um, he's credited also with um, having a massive hand in the big deal that Sarah Jessica Parker got because there was a, the show had sex in the title and it was on the Fight Channel. And so it was really strange that someone as conservative as Sarah Jessica Parker would even agree to do it. So he, she got all these, like, like her name 
directly underneath the show and you'll see it. She's always on the posters as the main person. Yeah, I, yeah. she does seem like the star. So it wasn't that surprising to hear that she was the best paid. But, yeah, I can imagine that the other three... Yeah. It's like being in a band and the... You know, you hear of the most successful bands, they'll... Uh, the ones that stay together, they'll often have a deal where they just share everything. Oh, divvy it all up. Yeah. And that makes sense. Because it's like, we're all doing very well. (laughs) (laughs) It's probably fine. You know, it would be weird to be like, hey, these are my friends. I just make sure they're paid a little less than me. (laughs) We do the same amount of work, but uh, I'm the star. (laughs) Yeah, it sounds like do go on. No. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Jess demands to be paid <laughs> yeah. four times as much as Matt and I as the Correct. star, and uh, she gets paid for her balance, of course. And also because of her big feet. Yeah, yeah. We, we decided we got paid the most uh, with a balance competition, <laughs> and Dave and I regretted it instantly. Oh, I fell over in the first eight <laughs> seconds. Oh, also, I have to pay to be here. <laughs> also, she needs extra money to buy her bigger shoes. That's, That's right. right. That's a lot custom of made. Yeah, correct. Exactly. All right. So um, Sarah Jessica Parker knew of Candace's column as well because Matthew Broderick, her husband, rode a souped-up bicycle growing up in New York City and Candace had written an article about that particular type of man who rode a bike all around New York City called What Has Two Wheels, Wears Sea Sucker and Makes a Sucker of Me, A Bicycle Boy. <laughs> 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 and, and so. Great. And so Sounds so hot. <laughs> uh, do you know what a seer sucker suit no. is? No. Have you ever heard of that? It doesn't, yeah, it sounds like a lollipop or something. Seer sucker. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well, maybe it's a suit made of lollipops. A bicycle boy is so funny. <laughs> bicycle boy, yeah. Oh, I'm a real sucker for that bicycle boy. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, apparently it was like a phenomenon of lots of men in their 30s riding bicycles everywhere to seem kind of, I don't know, kooky and like or something. I don't and, know. And Broderick fit that. Yeah, correct. Exactly. Um, so it seems like a suit is just like a lightweight suit that they would ride around in summer. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, they're cool. I could see Dave wearing a seersucker. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Pretty fancy. They're originally from New Orleans. Yeah, they look like fancy. That make, makes sense. A hotter climate sort of suit maybe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they could still ride their bicycles around. When I'm riding my bike, I like to suit up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, be a bicycle boy. Exactly. Um, Anyway, so that's how Sarah Jessica Parker knew of Candace. And once she read the script, she was all for it. Um, And, yeah, so that's how she got cast as Carrie. The second character to be cast was Kristen Davis as Charlotte. Initially, when it looked like SJP wasn't keen, she was sent the script for Carrie but immediately knew the role wasn't for her. Charlotte was a tiny part initially in that script, but Kristen just had a gut feeling that the show needed Charlotte's conservative, optimistic viewpoint and that she could really play her. Who was Charlotte in Dugan? Did you decide? Oh, no, we, well, that was your job. You didn't give us all oh, You only gave it. me Samantha, which I'm not sure is quite right. But <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I don't know now. No, I, maybe you're more a Miranda, actually. The red hair. I think, red I, hair. I, think I might be a Matthew Broderick bicycle boy type. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon that I think you might be. Who would you be? So if you're like Cynthia Nixon, so you're yeah. Miranda quite Dave, Dave's Dave Cynthia's husband. Oh, Steve Brady. Steve Brady. Hey, Steve. What if Steve? <laughs> you and me, Dave. Yeah. You and no, I've got no idea who this is, but I'm going to agree to it. All right, excellent. Well, I think he's like, I think he's like the only likable guy in the show, isn't he? Yeah. Oh, no, Aiden Shaw is pretty likable too. But, yeah, he is. Steve Brady's the one that's the best one. Everyone loves Steve. I reckon that Dave might be the carry of the group. Yeah, that's true. Do you think, like, the, the leader? Smoking, breaking the fourth wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tippy tap typing on my keyboard. Yeah, correct, exactly. And then maybe I don't know then who Jess would be though. It's very tricky. Yeah. Are you? Be? Who are you? Because you're the. Are you oh, the Charlotte? Maybe I'm the Charlotte. Oh, Charlotte's so boring. Is she? Right. I like Miranda, but yeah, I'm probably the Charlotte. No, you're. Yeah, well. Yeah. I, I feel like we. You don't really we're not, fit. Yeah, not like the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> <laughs> they certainly don't yeah, rip off our lives. Exactly. The Ninja Turtles are. <laughs> They're every man. Yeah. They are every man. Correct. Exactly. All right. Anyway, back to Charlotte. So um, so Kristen Davis had a gut feeling that um, Charlotte would become a bigger part. And Darren agreed. Having worked with Kristen Davis on Melrose, he described her as the perfect mix of beautiful wide-eyed girl next door that also makes you want to throw a pie in her face. <laughs> <laughs> she was 
and, and every episode there has to be some sort of elaborate setup where she gets pied in the face. <laughs> Actually, it's funny you say that because often that does happen in the show. She gets into kind of the worst situations because it is very funny for some reason. Wait, which character is this? Charlotte. Charlotte, right. Yeah. Um, she's the most sensible, but she's getting in the worst situations. Yeah, well, she's the most conservative, I guess, and, re- and kind of naive, I think. She comes from like a very upper crust, wealthy sort of family and has this idea of who she oh, should marry. Oh, maybe she's Dave, kind of yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds like Dave. Popping a pie Jess, in the face. So Apple Jess is Carrie in the face. and Dave is Charlotte. Yeah. yeah, I think we've got it now, yeah. Um, actually, you might recognise things. I know you're a big fan, Dave, of Seinfeld. She played the girlfriend who unwittingly brushes her teeth with a toothbrush that has fallen in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm going to look up a photo so I can see all of them and imagine it. All right. Okay. So, yeah. So, Darren said she doesn't know how funny she is. And that's actually quite true. She's hilarious in the show. Um, Cynthia Nixon, the redhead, was cast. This is, who did we say? Matt Stewart. Oh, redhead as well. We've said this. Perfect. Was cast after a long back and forth. The main thing they were worried about was that she wasn't um, a redhead. She had to dye her hair. And oh, so really, that was written into the character. Yeah, and they just she kept coming in and auditioning, and they kept going, "You're just not right for the part." That's so weird. <laughs> I know because she just had blonde hair at the time. I once got knocked back from a a pub on my my ID because I said my hair color was different. The bouncer's looking at my ID, going, "Your hair color's different." I'm like, "Well, it's not." Plus. <laughs> You can do that. You know, there, <laughs> there is technology to change hair colour. He's never seen that before. It's like, look at the face. That's the bit you should be checking on. <laughs> no, but the hair colour's different. It's just not right. Oh. How's it, have you done that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like your hair colour. Thanks, Claire. You're welcome. But they didn't like Cynthia Nixon's, apparently. Anyway, so once she agreed to change her hair, her manager... <laughs> <laughs> that is feels so strange. I know. She had to audition like 10 times or something. Sometimes I feel like that sometimes casting agents have no imagination at all. And that sounds like it proves it a bit there. You're like, you can't picture with a different hair yeah. colour or just picture the character with brown hair. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it's so weird, isn't no, it? No, I, I just don't think that's possible. Sorry, there's several plot no. lines where Charlotte gets a pie in the face and other plot lines about how she's a redhead. Yeah. <laughs> so we've already written the season. <laughs> um, anyway, so Cynthia Nixon was an, an accomplished theatre actor who'd never really been in TV before, but she wanted to stay in New York City because that's where she lived and she loves New York. Um, and so she went, and she also applied. Um, recently went to be the governor of New York City. So she really? was. Uh, she she went up. I don't know for election a few years ago. Anyway, side note. She really loves it. She really loves New York City. Um. Anyway, so Kim Cattrall was the last to be cast, and she really didn't want the role. So she's the cement. <laughs> Please, <laughs> they're, they're forcing it. people into this show. <laughs> I know. Not I know. is there a single one of them who wanted to be on it? <laughs> oh no. Well, I think because that's the shows you write at the time, like being in a show called Sex in the City. Now we're like Sex in the City, but at the time, even a show with the sex in the title was like. That's it's really funny, awful. yeah. It couldn't sound any tamer now, but yeah. But, but their manager's like, "You got to do this, please. I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, <Don't> make me." <laughs> well, there's like huge amounts of nudity, I guess, as well in it, and it's very explicit, all of that stuff. So Kim Cattrall really had to be convinced by Darren Star to do it, and I feel like that has actually haunted her for the whole of the TV series that she never really wanted to play Samantha in the oh, first place, right. even though she's brilliant in the role and hilarious. And she's like the most famous one, like character, I think. Without knowing the show very well, I know her character. She's sort of like the fun out there one. Yeah, the partier. Yeah. yeah. That's so interesting that you would say that. So, yeah. I guess, it, yeah, she is. And her, that's her argument, right? Because she doesn't get paid the same amount as, right. as um, Sarah Jessica Parker. And that's really the crux of why she's not doing the third movie. Oh, right. And where all the controversy started from because she thinks she's everyone's favourite and should be paid the same as SJP. Mm. But at the time when she was cast, she her, she her career was on the downhill. And so Sarah Jessica Parker was the blonde movie star and she was, you know, seems second Seems strange, but by this stage they haven't gone, let's or let's all just, you know, come together like the Friends cast did. Yeah. They all came yeah. together and everyone got paid the same in the end and it was a real family. But obviously they just don't like her very much. Yeah. Otherwise they probably would have, right? <laughs> well, or I'm, I'm obviously, I'm simplifying and I might be missing something. Well, but it feels like... We're all getting paid multi, multi millions. Let's just make it nice and all get paid the same. Yeah, right. Well, exactly. A lot of people are saying that. I think the problem is that because Sarah Jessica Parker, the the sort of line is she took such a risk 
in putting her name to the show and she was the big star initially and she's also a producer on the show so she and she's like contributed to the writing and right. put so much work into it that really she and her contract is ironclad like right. unless she unpicked it herself yeah okay. then they but exactly like maybe they should have just done that i mean what's the difference between Billions and squillions. Yeah. I don't know. I guess once you're earning that amount, you start to notice. But from down here, <laughs> it's like, what's the, what's the difference? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I think the Friends people, they agreed early on, though. Right. Okay. And then once it's the precedent is established, I get paid more than everyone. I'm the lead. Yeah. Yeah, I don't Maybe know. It's it just makes to... it feel like an uncomfortable scenario. I just I feel like I would feel weird being that person. But, I mean, it would make sense if everyone's acting fee was the same and then she got paid a producer's, a producer's credit cr- or something, yeah. thing, and that would make sense. But yeah. anyway, Who you know, knows? hey, look, if you're listening, uh, <laughs> Sarah, Jessica Sarah Jessica Parker, Parker. hey, you do you. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was about to make a phone call. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll keep thinking about it then. I think Matt Stewart from Do Miller Podcast has changed my mind. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Yeah, anyway, it's quite interesting, really, how that all happens. Um, so after all of that and they they start, they had the pilot, they end up producing the whole first season and they make the whole thing set in New York City. So there's no sets involved. Everything is filmed on location. And because they're unknown, they can do that. They film in all the bars and all oh, the places right. and iconic stuff, which is another reason why everyone loves the show so much. Yeah, in a lot of ways... Uh, the fifth character of the show is the city. <laughs> <laughs> you do know a lot about this show. I that's feel like a, you're that's a just the trope fan. people say all the time. Oh, the, the actual the fifth character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the writers' room actually call her the fifth lady. Oh, uh, there you go. Yeah. It's, uh, that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> it is really, isn't it? I know. I love it so much. Anyway, so New they... Yorkers have a real. They think they're the, it's the most unique place in the world. I love hearing New Yorkers talk about it. you. If you're not from here, you don't get it. Yeah. If you weren't born here, you're not really a New Yorker. <laughs> yeah, you might live here now. For the last not 70 a, years. <laughs> you're not a New Yorker. <laughs> I love that kind of uh, strange belief in a place. Yeah, do you feel like that about Melbourne? Seinfeld talks about it like that. He's like, you know, city. It's, uh, it's living and it's breathing. <laughs> like, unlike any other city, this one's different. <laughs> And there's probably New Yorkers listening right now who are furious. <laughs> They're yelling at their iPods, and I apologise. I agree. I've been there. It's like no other place. Like <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Actually, because a lot of people said, came out and said New York City was dead because of COVID. Yeah, that's and the right. Pandemic. And Seinfeld came out and was like really he wrote offended. A, yeah, he, he was replying to a blog about it, and he was yeah. yeah furious about it, which, I mean, it was ridiculous to be like, Oh, to me, it was like, yeah, that it'll recover, obviously. It seems strange that someone thought... Yeah, that it would be dead. Anyway. And so, yeah, he really, he found that very frustrating. He did. He's very obsessed with his city. He loves New York City. He, really he loves, loves those Mets. He loves them. He always wanted to be an urban dude. Yeah, yeah. I wonder time. if he's a bicycle boy. <laughs> <as well. laughs> All right, okay. So um, the show launched, they had no idea how it was going to go, on June 6th, 1998, Um, and touted as a show about everything as opposed to Seinfeld's A Show About Nothing, (laughs) it actually hit critical not acclaim. Oh. The opposite of not acclaim Oh, the listeners at home, Claire wrote, read, critical, turn the page. Here we go. (laughs) And I I, I don't know if you were thinking this, Dave, but I was thinking acclaim. (laughs) Yeah, I was thinking, oh, it's a hit from day one. (laughs) But when the page Uh turned... (laughs) Oof. Unacclaim? <laughs> Holy shit. What? What? Oh, people are going to look back at this episode and just think, genius. Yeah. But not at all. I don't know what I'm doing. Anyway, let's soldier on. <laughs> so critical, not a claim. No, so it yeah. was not a claim. No. You know what I think about this podcast, by the way? I reckon the fourth character is this room. Yes. <laughs> this studio just lives and breathes. I can hear it through the walls. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just the setting, you know? Mm, means everything. It does. I wish we could make us Cosmos, then I'd be really oh, there for it. I feel like that right Fuck, now. Wouldn't that be good? I know. What is a Cosmos? It's vodka and pink. It's pink. <laughs> vodka and pink. That's it. I think it's cranberry, actually. Cranberry juice, vodka, something else good. But lime. Lime, I think. I'd drink that. Yeah, I'd yeah. drink. I would drink that. Free to go. 
Oh, love it. Maybe we could ring up Michael Patrick King's dad and get him to deliver us some beer and coal. Oh. Oh. Mm. That'd be good. <laughs> That's an essential worker. <laughs> Excellent. Um, anyway, so I've got a couple of reviews here. There were one uh, that was done by, oh, no, and it's on the opposite page, Tom Shale from the Washington Post. He says. Here we go, Tom Shale. He wouldn't get it. From Washington? Yeah, yeah good luck understanding this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Sarah Jessica Parker has an in-your-face face. In her new HBO comedy series, Sex oh and the God. City, she's always, she always seems to be thrusting it forward. She's in love with the camera. Unfortunately, it's unrequited. Oh, my goodness. Parker, with her scraggly hair and jutty jaw, is certainly not the worst thing about this smirky, jerky sex com, but she usually seems so light and funny that it's dismaying to see her in bad form, looking like a walking flea market and coming across about as subtly as a tsunami. Okay. (laughs) That's a little mean. Yeah, that's just like, I mean... That I think that more than anything else shows you where this show, like the time it came out in. Right? Yeah, exactly. Because that's what's so funny. All of these reviewers are blokes right at the time. So it's just all men writing about the show, watching it and going, I don't get it. It's too full on. <laughs> he, he may as well have said unladylike. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But he's trying to be witty. He's like, guys, I'm the modern day Dorothy Parker. Yeah. I'll take it from here. <laughs> I got some zingers in my pocket. Yeah, oh, absolute shocker. There's nothing oh. worse than a reviewer who thinks that they're being clever. I know, exactly. Like Eric Mink from the New York Daily News, from the constant smoking to the constant whining, Darren Starr, who wrote several of the scripts, has again given his actors and directors dialogue and plot lines that make it virtually impossible for them to do anything but laboriously go through the motions of real life. Ugh, more like... Stink, other than Mink. <laughs> that was his name. <laughs> Eric Stink. Eric not, Stink. Eric Stink. Fucking exactly. Loser. Uh, what I also find funny about that is that he's canning, like, a show about real life, except this was before reality TV, which now is, like, the best thing that everyone wants to watch, obviously. Not me personally. The best thing. The best no, thing. you said it. Best thing hey, that everyone wants to watch. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Great. It is. It's genius. All right. Anyway... Another interesting fact I thought you might be interested in to know. The interesting fact is interesting. We love them. We love them. The biggest cult following started to build around the show. And interestingly, when the cast walked down the street, the biggest sort of demographic were African-American men who were like constantly really Really? Into it and massive in that community. Wow. Yeah, they were like diehard fans. And I think it's because it was on HBO that was had all the fighting and the sports. And then Sex and the City would come on. Oh, right. You'd be watching the boxing and then they'd come on and you're like, you're like, Matt, I'll just watch a little bit of this while the phone charges. <laughs> <laughs> By the end, you're like, play it again. I loved it. Yeah, yeah amazing. Yeah. I, I think that that is really interesting. That It feels like a massive gamble to put this on a, a sports channel. And they had they done no no big dramas before this? No. Nah. Yeah. Wow. I know. Because, yeah, so this is the, I mean, you've already said this and we've already been astonished by it, but I'm just doing it again. Great. This Sorry, this changed the fucking game. <laughs> yeah. It's like Fox Sports. They're yeah. chucking on a sitcom. As soon yeah. as Sarah Jessica Parker, SJP as I call her, <laughs> thrust at her chin. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we into never the, look back. Yeah, into the world of television. Yeah. Do they zoom in a lot in the first episode or something? Yeah, they actually do. I actually kind of agree with some oh, of okay. that. <laughs> there is some weird angles where she's constantly like, hmm. It's Into funny that, the, like, he's talking about it like she's also directing the camera operators. Yeah. yeah exactly. I know. I just feel like... Or, or that the it. camera operator is just there and she's against everyone's will. <laughs> she's <laughs> running up to, it. to get up close She's like, to can it. you just focus more on my chin? That's what I'm about. <laughs> yeah, they're just, like, locked she's, off and she's just running up to like, it. Pointing the chin out. Oh, maybe it was because it was a boxing channel. That's, like, leading with your chin oh, is, like, yeah. a, a sign of arrogance oh. in boxing. Is it? I can't have a... Yeah. Go on. Got a granite chin. Me. Oh, is that how they why they lift it up like that when you're they're gonna go to a fight? Talking like I'm a real boxing. Oh yeah, you, you know you're. Stuck. There is a there's a term leading with your chin. I'm sure. That sounds right. I believe. I know having a strong chin means you you don't get knocked down, don't get knocked out. Or, and if you have a glass jaw, you easily you're easily knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Continue. there's some boxing fans are absolutely yelling at their <laughs> iPods right now. <laughs> No, I could, I just feel like you should keep calling. <laughs> yeah, people are really you're, learning a lot. You are. <laughs> you're feeling just as she's beautifully. She loves just leaving space for me to <laughs> yeah, put my yeah. foot in my mouth. Keep talking. Ironic for Jess, she's her foot's too big to put in her <laughs> mouth. <laughs> <sighs> 
Well, she is the carry of the group now. That's that true. Is. So I'm Charlotte. All right, I've just looked it up. Dictionary.com, uh, leading with your chin. Take a risk. Did you Behave just say dictionary.com? With... Dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that really shows where Claire's head's at. Come on, Matt. That's your other favourite source, <laughs> dictionary.com. <laughs> Sticking with the theme of the podcast. Uh, for example, Gordon always says exactly what he thinks. He never minds leading with his chin. This term alludes to a boxer leaving his chin, a vulnerable point, unprotected. So I pretty much what I said was pretty much true. Yeah, You're think... an expert in boxing, Holy apparently. shit. Holy shit. Who knew? I, so occasionally I watch boxing with some friends. And uh, like Rob Hunter, Dave, you know, yeah, comedian, and he's yep. like a big boxing fan, and he I did not si- know that. he sits with a pad and he scores himself. You know, you wow. like yeah. unless it's a knockout, uh, it goes to the points, and he scores himself and checks it against the judges scoring. Like, so he's a big fan, big fan. Wow, wow, big fan, huge, huge fan. <laughs> He leads with his chin. So I've learned a bit from him. Uh, yeah, he really, yeah. Rob Hunter leads with his chin, no doubt about that. All right, no doubt at all. Excellent. Do you, you would lead with your chin too, with your beard. Yeah. That would be the well, first thing. You I enter mean, into a room with your chin. Yes. Yeah, but people swing for that. They don't know how big your chin is. Yeah, that's right. That's like the false chin. <laughs> it's, it's self-protection, if anything. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, that's genius. Oh, maybe I should grow a beard too. I think you should. I think I should. I think everyone should. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Okay. Shall I continue? How are Please, we doing? Do go on. Do go on. Do go on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. It's the, is that how the... Now I understand the show. Ah, oh, I never knew. Um, all right. So the first series screened and um, to critical unacclaim, but the fans loved it and HBO started to get more and more subscribers. And then the show was actually an, or nominated for an Emmy. An Emmy? An Emmy? Yeah, right. So it took a while to make the mainstream. They're still winning enemies and. The sea and enemies. Anyway, they got an enemy. I can't say an enemy. They made an enemy for themselves in Eric Stink. No. Fuck you, Eric Stink. Fuck you, Eric Stink. Yeah, exactly. No, they got an Emmy. Emmy? Yes. Emmy. Emmy. Uh, Emmy. Emmy. What's that? What's Emmy? Emmy. Ma- what's Emmy mean? Um, Emmy means. Is e- M- yeah, just, e- or is it just know. is it named after someone called Greg Emmy or something? M E me 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 uh, the me awards My, the me awards. It's about you and me. They're yeah, me. I've never thought about that before because you know, like know. the Oscars are named after some guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe Oscar. they're not there's sure. rumors. Yeah. Oscar. He leaves you okay. And like a Tony Award, that's Antoinette Perry. Oh. Do you know what the Emmys are named? But no, after? I don't. I don't know either. Yeah, um, I've never thought about that. Why you look that up? I'll just let you know that it was nominated for an Emmy. SATC it was nominated um, for outstanding comedy series in 1999. So as the second season came to be, and it was the first cable series of all time um, to be nominated. As like for an Emmy Award. Oh, that's great! Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Mm, exactly. And from there, HBO subscription exploded due to people all over the world falling in love with the show. And it became a global phenomenon. Have we worked out all the Emmys? Yeah. Well, this is according to Wikipedia.org. I don't know if you're familiar Orge. with that website. Oh God. Uh, the big O and the they. <laughs> the big orgy. Oh, that's what the O stands for. Yeah. Ah, oh, uh, now I get it. So, the, according to them, the Emmy is named after Emmy. <laughs> An informal term for the image orthicon tube that was common in early television cameras. Although the weight and dimensions of the statuette may vary among the Emmy events, the basic design depicts a winged woman holding an atom. Ah. Why wouldn't they call them the Emmys then? So weird to name them after Emmys, just changing one letter. That is weird. God, the world is weird. Oh, it's beautiful. You should bro. write to it's them. Mysterious. It's mysterious. Beautiful. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. It is. <laughs> it's marvelous. Marvelous. It's marvelous. fantastic. <laughs> it's excellent. You should, after you speak to Sarah Jessica Parker about her feud with Kim Cattrall, you should also ring up the Emmys organizers and tell them they should call it the Emmys. Yeah. The Emmys. What's going on Let's there? Let's write that wrong. Yeah. You totally should, Matt. They listen to you. You've got a chin. With a beard. Yeah, that's and every, true. And everyone knows you listen with to people with chins and beards. All right. Back to the global phenomenon that was Sex and the City. Um, it shaped the way that people started to date and eat and even dress and changed the language around what it was and wasn't okay to talk about in terms of sex and relationships. Cynthia Nixon is said to, to have said that the fame grew and grew and it really hit home when they appeared on the front of Time magazine. Yeah, people in Sex and the City were raw, dimensional and valuable, funny and frank. 
And as it documented the age-old search for lust as well as love from the female perspective, it really changed the game. Um, instead of representing women as burning the roast while waiting for their husband to come home from work with, with their boss for a dinner party, <laughs> that invariably... Wait, is, that, is that a trope? <laughs> yeah. That's burning the roast. <laughs> you know, haven't you seen it? It's in like Bewitched and all oh, of those yeah. like old like sitcoms. This show about four women was brash and bold and full of poignancy and emotional depth. The writers spliced its episode with highly comedic sex scenes. So even though it seems like a show about sex, really, the sex was usually always there for comedy value. Um, and then the real heart of the show was the friendship between the women. Sex is funny <laughs> if you're doing it right. Oh, my God. It's so funny. If you're not laughing, you're wrong. These people having big O's. I'm like, what are you not doing? Whoa, whoa. My big O is the O in LOL. <laughs> <laughs> LOL. Yeah. All right. What am I saying? Women finally had a show that reflected the way they talked to each other. And men would say it was like being a fly on the wall while women dissected um, them, really. (laughs) Not literally, you know, metaphorically. (laughs) No one's dissecting any men on the show. Anyway, Sex and the City predated Curb Curb Your Enthusiasm and The Sopranos on HBO. Um, And obviously, as you talked about, was a smash hit. Overall, it aired from 1998 to 2004 with 94 episodes in all, 54 Emmy nominations and seven wins. A prequel called The Carrie Diaries ran from 2013 to 14, and it also spawned two movies, Sex and the City in 2008, which we've already talked about was a smash hit. And, and people love that one. They bloody love it. You love that one? I, lo- I do love it. I love yeah. it so much. I, love I can't it remember much. anything about it, but I just remember <laughs> looking up at it. Yeah. I've been drinking cocktails by the pool all day. <laughs> Could not have felt any more like Connected. I was yeah. Well, Carrie, one of the one of the gang. <laughs> Carrie gets married to Big in it and nearly gets married and then he like jilts her at the altar and there's that scene where she's in a big fancy wedding dress and she like throws her bouquet at him and it's a whole big drama. Oh. That's kind of what the the premise of that whole storyline centers around because the whole show really is about whether or not Carrie and Big will get together. Right. And then all the other kind of plot lines twist around that. Um, so it's $415 million is the figure that it made at the box office, that movie. And the second film made a similar amount, though people obviously hated it. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Completely. Obviously. Yeah. I'm surprised that it only ran for, what, six seasons? Mm, it, it, yeah. It seemed like it was around for ages. Yeah. Well, it's just played so often now. Yeah, like, It's right. still on all the time. Um, and the third movie um, was slated um, a few years ago, and then there was all this controversy about Kim trial and she pulled out at the last minute so apparently the script was actually really amazing and so the cast and crew and everyone is still kind of really mad at Kim Cattrall because she pulled out and and now the third movie is currently in production called and just like that and Kim Cattrall is not a part of it is it and is it mostly a money issue they think it is, yeah, though they also think that part of it is to do with the fact that Kim Cattrall is scared of trying to play Samantha again because now she's in her 60s and there's a huge amount of sex scenes for Samantha's character and a lot of nudity and she's supposed to be this kind of like rock and bombshell and now she's in her 60s and feels like maybe she wouldn't be up to the task. Right. So there's like rumours about that. She's rumoured to come out on Twitter and have like made a massive attack at Sarah Jessica Parker and said that she's never actually been very nice and they were never never friends and oh, and all this sucks. stuff, even though the rest of the cast and crew who were interviewed actually in a really great podcast called Origins about Sex in the City said that that wasn't true, that actually once she was on set, Kim Cattrall had a great time with the women. It was just that in negotiations around money, things always fell through because as Matt thinks, she should have been paid the same amount as Sarah Yeah. Oscar. Well, I mean, if we're trying to figure out whether or not she had a good time on set, I think... You wouldn't listen to what she said. I would definitely be listening to the other people. They'd know. They'd know. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't they? Exactly. Um, anyway, so the movie fell over and now the third movie and just like that is in production. Um, so just a few cheeky facts. Um, after that public feud and all of the things and the movies launching, I thought I'd just talk quickly and I'll skip some of this stuff because it's quite long. Um, there are a few really interesting parts of the film, of the TV show, one of which was um, when 9-11 happened. So obviously September 11th, 2001 was when the Twin Towers came down and many credit Sex and the City with encouraging New York to rebuild and thrive with tourists continuing to visit with confidence after it happened. 
So the show's narrative nods to the events of 9-11 itself were deft, subtle and moving while it continued to portray New York City as the greatest, freest and most glamorous place on earth. So the the six episodes that ran that January and February in 2001 um, were the first to appear after the attack and made no direct mention of that day for good reason because they'd been shot before it happened. But just as a coincidence, two unintended tributes were already filmed within those two episodes. So in the second episode, there was a loving shot of a souvenir snow globe of the Twin Towers, even though this was before the attack even happened. Whoa! I know, crazy. And the season finale titled I Heart NY emerged as one of the sweetest 9-11 elegies television had to offer, even though it hadn't been written as such. So it's kind of an episode where Carrie just talks about the fifth lady in New York and how much she (laughs) loves the city. And it just by coincidence incidents ran just after the attacks happened. Uh, it make, kind of makes sense to me that that would end up being one of the better ones because, you know, you, you're not bogged down by some full-on emotions and... Right, yeah. You're mm. riding it just, a, you know, without all of that baggage. which yeah. is like, And pressure. How much pressure you would feel to write an episode just after an event like that to do the city justice, if you know what I mean. I don't know if that makes any sense, but... Yeah, no, it does. It totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, They actually did try and write... So the next season that comes, the... um They had some beautiful kind of nods to New York City as well, one of which was that first episode about Navy officers and it's like called Fleet Week and so Carrie talks more and more about how she's in love with the city even though she's got this really sexy Navy guy there. She's like, no, I'm not going home with you, I'm going home with my city. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. She'll never let me down. You're right, it was better that they wrote the other ones before. Yeah, Yeah, exactly, not quite as good. It's interesting because when the show started filming, all the New Yorkers were like, Get out of here. We don't like this. You're taking over our streets. That's supposed to be a New York accent. Yeah, that was a wow. How did I do? Actually, yeah. You threw me for a second. I'm like, have you been putting on an Australian accent all this time? (laughs) I feel like I deserve an Emmy Award for that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Get this woman an Emmy. (laughs) Um, Anyway, but after that, three years later, when Sex and the City was booming, um, locals loved the fact that it brought starry-eyed tourists and new residents to town, and the show sent throngs to the Pleasure Chest and Sushi Samba turned Magnolia Bakery, as we discussed, from a sleep, sleepy West Village neighbourhood spot into a tourist scene requiring a bouncer and transformed the meatpacking district district into hot real estate. Oh, I went to the meatpacking district. I didn't know there was a connection. When The night I got to New York, um, we just jumped in, me and my mate jumped in a cab and said, take us to a cool place. And he took us to a pub in the meatpacking district. Oh. So I'm cool. like, what a funny place. Like, Where do you want to go out? I'll take you to the meat. Yeah. Place. They're like, all right. <laughs> I'll spend my time packing some meat packets. <laughs> Does it smell bad there? <laughs> I think I it, I, it must have been like traditionally where they pack meat. I didn't... Putting sausages in boxes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it was. And then it sort of it became gentrified, I think. I think it's right. a bit like, you know, Fitzroy in Melbourne. It's very much the equivalent or something. Oh, gotcha. You know, it became cool. Because Samantha moved, moves there in one of the seasons um, and she's like, all oh, the meatpacking district's super cool now. Um, yeah, so they really put that place on the map. Um, also, as we've mentioned, Cosmopolitans became just like a massive thing and so exciting. Everybody loved them. <laughs> it was really great. And millions of women dreamed one day of living in a version of Carrie's brownstone apartment or strolling through Central Park in Jimmy Choo Shoes as the leaves turned in autumn. So, Jimmy Choo Shoes. Jimmy Choo Shoes, correct, exactly. Um, yeah, so very exciting. It put lots of restaurants on the map as well. Um, I've just got a couple of extra things to talk about, one of which is the fashion. So as you might know, the fashion in New York in um, Sex and the City is really famous um, and it's run by this costume designer who's a legend called Patricia Field and she's very kind of New York in the way she talks and quite gravelly. She sounds like, you know, like a cool smoking woman. I don't know. She's awesome and a bit scary. But she just had this really unique style, um, really distinct, irreverent and often envelope pushing and she just turned the film into and the TV show into a juggernaut because of that. And so often Michael Patrick King would be fighting with her over costuming because they'd have like a scene in an apartment with her and Carrie and say her boyfriend Aiden would just be arguing over razors and like deodorant or something. 
and she'd have Kerry dressed in a top hat and ruffles <laughs> <laughs> or something like ridiculous and, and Aiden would have a top that said virgin or something and she's like and Michael had Patrick King would have to be like they're just in their apartment on a Friday afternoon <laughs> can we tone it down but that was actually it became iconic and so so that made it through she would just be randomly wearing top hats and stuff <laughs> yeah not in that scene because that he really fought for that scene and that's a really amazing scene about um, Aiden moving in with her and how that all happens but there's yeah a lot of that kind of stuff they'll just be walking down the street on a Thursday and Carrie's wearing I don't know some kind of like sculpture on her head with like a giant <laughs> bird <laughs> or a huge butterfly or like a like a really like I don't know crazy coat or something um, and she's often wearing heels and with like tiny shorts or I don't know just all kinds of crazy amazing well you know stuff. that um, actually reminds me that in my mind the sixth character of the show is the fashion. <laughs> it's, the, it's the birds that she would wear. <laughs> Not it. Well, actually, I don't know if you know the poster of Sex in the City. Have you seen the tutu that Sarah Jessica Parker wears? Have you seen that's quite that an iconic bell. image? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that tutu was that tutu was found in a bargain bin for five bucks, and now it would be worth like. 10, 20 bucks. 10, 20 bucks. <laughs> millions Whoa. of dollars. <laughs> anyway, so Patricia Field was known for mixing really high quality, expensive stuff with really cheap stuff as well. Yeah. Um, and Carrie's necklace as well. She wears this really iconic necklace that says Carrie um, <laughs> was was really t- like a couple of dollars or something. So yeah, She wears a necklace with her name on it. She certainly does and it became iconic. Oh. It's I can wonderful. see that. I'm wearing one right now. Is that? Do you wear one that says Carrie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, correct, exactly. Um, I always is her name Carrie. I always yeah. thought it was Carrie. Carrie, it's Carrie. Well, it's Carrie, I guess. C A R R I E. So Carrie, yeah. But they, but in America, they pronounce that more like Carrie. Yeah, yeah right. Okay, so. uh, maybe I've only ever seen it written down. Yeah, Carrie, Carrie. Yeah, they probably oh, don't that's... say. They probably don't say carry, no. <laughs> carry, <laughs> boy, carry. <laughs> Get over here, Get carry. Over here. Yeah. Why are you wearing a f- flaming top hat? <laughs> yeah, galah. Get yeah, over bloody, here. What are you, bloody galah? <laughs> what are you, drongo? Oh, strut. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, no, I'm your uh, Carrie. Yeah, yeah, nah. <laughs> yeah, nah, I'm your Carrie. Yeah, when she, Carrie. Gets, <laughs> when she gets married in the first movie, which you would be familiar with, she has a bird on her head. Oh. Yeah, on her wedding dress, like a bright blue bird. Is it meant to be there? Yeah. <laughs> 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 one of the dogs came out early. Yeah, yeah. But no one no one knows that it's not meant to be there. <laughs> when is where does the fashion end and yeah. where the pest yeah. Sorry, yeah. Kerry, we no. thought that you uh <laughs> we thought that you <laughs> wanted to wear that. Correct, exactly. Oh god. Anyway, um yeah, so just a couple of final things. The writer's room is really interesting in Sex and the City. So for the first three seasons, Darren Starr and Patrick King were working together, but they were often arguing about what the show should be like. <laughs> it's only a lot of arguing behind <laughs> no, the scenes. A lot of arguing. And in the end, Darren Starr leaves after season three and Michael Patrick King starts to write the show in the way that he sees it, which is much more emotional. So the characters really start to change and grow. Ah. So like Carrie might become Charlotte or, or a bit more a bit softer or like um, Cynthia Nixon's character ends up having a baby and they explore all of that kind of stuff. So is, um, there, is there, there's a writer's room as well? or the, But mm. these are the head writers. Is, are, are there women on the writing team? Great question, Matthew. So, um, yeah, so Patrick Michael King decides to hire a team of all female writers to okay. write this part of the show. So they were constantly in the early days just asking the cast themselves for input. Because, what do you reckon? Yeah. What do you think about this scene? Because <laughs> when you were saying before that it's, it felt like men watching were eavesdropping on women. I'm like, but it was written by men. It was like <laughs> men eavesdropping on women saying words written by men. But, the, yeah, that makes know, more it's sense. It's very confusing, isn't it? I know, I think... It's like a Shakespeare thing where it's a, a boy playing a woman playing a boy playing a woman or whatever. Yeah, it's very <laughs> Is that something that happened in Shakespeare? Playing, <laughs> playing their own yeah. twin. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's Gwyneth Paltrow and Shakespeare in Love. Absolutely. No, um, yeah, so, well, that's very true. So they were... Michael Patrick King grew up with women and they're both gay, so... They had a lot of female friends, I think. Plus, they'd based it on Candace's column. So oh, did she have of... any input after the column? I don't think... Like ongoing sort of stuff? they check in with her, yeah. I yeah, don't sure. think she was actually on the writing team, but she definitely um, Hopefully had she was input. Cashing some sweet, sweet royalty checks. Yeah, totally. I hope so. surely. But, yeah, wouldn't that be strange to have no control over this character based on you that yeah. sort of becomes a runaway success? 
I know. Yeah, and she does get interviewed and I think she feels like the Carrie in the show is different to her and she gets annoyed too that people think that she's the same. Oh, Because people would be like... Yeah, exactly I've seen like that show that. about you. Yeah. D- yeah. That doco. You look yeah. a bit different, but... Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. yeah, one of the things she says she annoys her is that the n- narrative arc in the show is all about finding love and that for women the only way that you're going to ever be happy is if you find a man. And she actually really pushes back really hard on that idea that women the only path for women is to be with a man. And she said in her life she's actually realised that it's not that she wanted to be with a guy like Mr Big, it's that she wanted to be Mr Big. Right. And at that time in history and probably a bit still now, women can't, it's very hard for women to be Mr Big. So, but they can be adjacent to that kind of power and wealth. And so that's kind of what annoys her about the show in that she feels that, um, yeah, it depicts the idea that women just have to find love and that Carrie ends up, spoiler alert, with Mr. Big in the end of the show uh, also really annoys her Right. Too. Yeah, I, I should, thought it would be the kind of show that would not do that. Yeah. You know, in the end, like have her find that she's happy without <laughs> Mr. Without Big. Without a man. Yeah. But, yeah, that is interesting. But, yeah, I I guess this is like we were talking about before. The, the, you know, standards and expectations have changed a lot since the 90s. So maybe if it was made today, maybe that's what the third movie is going to do, maybe um, change some of that stuff. Well, I think they're hoping for that too because there's the other criticism is the cast isn't very diverse. So, But then, you know, it was made of a time. But all, And you were saying that it was quite... Um, a big deal that it was an all woman cast. So at the yeah. time, it, you know, it, you know, that's what you, sometimes you go. It, walls are slowly broken down, and then looking back, it it doesn't. You, you're judging on today's standards, yeah. but at the time, you're going. Well, we felt like we we're like pushing the envelope. Push, yeah, yeah so it's I tricky. Think, exactly. Well, I think that's the thing because shows like Girls couldn't have been made without shows like Sex and the City. Right. Um, but even that faces criticism now, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think everything. Yeah, does. so it's like you're yeah. right. The progressive at the time never seems progressive. Looking back, I guess. Yeah, it's so true. But um, yeah, you hope that it leads to the next thing that leads to the next thing. And yeah, totally, exactly. And so, what was groundbreaking is Michael 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 Matrick King. <laughs> 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 is this a new person? <laughs> Michael Patrick Ming. <laughs> um, he, he hired an all-women writing team because that, before that he was just asking women in his life what they thought. And the <laughs> just box swapping like, on the street. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do you reckon? Yeah, what do you reckon? Does this seem right? Um, and so the all-female writing team um, were there from season four to the end um, and they were kind of credited with really making the show what it was um, in those last seasons and delving really deep because they were all – he wanted women that were single, dating and living in New York. York, just like in the show. And so they all were doing that. So they constantly were just sitting in a room mining their dating lives. Oh, no. But imagine yeah. you get a partner, you get fired. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you're not single anymore. You're out. Yeah. Sorry, Sarah. Yeah, oh, well, no. Well, it's funny you say that because a lot of the women say that they actually found it really hard to find a anyone to date because men were so worried that they would end up in the show and they said with good reason because they always did end up in the show <laughs> um, and they actually became iconic in themselves in, in New York they became super famous and they were invited to everything from Paris Fashion Week to the hottest restaurant openings and front row seats to the best shows in New York um, and so that kind of team of writers became just like famous everywhere they went um, and they the show itself um had unexpected fans like Tom Cruise who once confessed to a cast member that he had an assistant take the show and FedEx it to him so he and his then girlfriend Penelope Cruise wouldn't miss out when they were in Europe. Even Senator John McCain had an opinion on whom Carrie should ultimately choose, breathlessly telling writer Amy B. Harris during the series' final stretch, Oh, when Carrie touched those diamonds, I knew she was never going to end up with Petrovsky. <laughs> 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 so, t- <laughs> have you never, what does that mean? No, have you never seen the show? Like, I'm, I mean, John McCain, what are you talking about? <laughs> okay, so, okay, so there's a scene. Uh, the last someone love, called okay. an ambulance immediately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the senator has taken ill. <laughs> so Petrovsky is Carrie's last love before she ends up with Mr. Big, right. and he's this like old Russian artist who's like doesn't. 
He's very kind of like kooky and like has dates at like three o'clock in the morning in like dark art galleries. And he gives her this like special diamond necklace and she goes with him to Paris. And anyway, Petrovsky. He's like very much Russian and like interesting. Um, and <laughs> Russian. Right, fantastic. Very, I've, obviously, yeah. I've obviously done the research. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he makes light installations or something. I don't know. Anyway, um, and so, He installs yeah. lighting. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's an electrician. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and he's a sparky. Then, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, famously at the last... Last scene, Petro- she's in the apartment in Paris with Petrovsky and he accidentally slaps her and it's very terrible and her car- her necklace breaks or her diamonds like break everywhere um, before that. And so that was one of the signs she knew and so did John McCain <laughs> that she wasn't destined to be with Petrovsky. And then John, or who like is the name of Mr Big, like turns up in Paris and is like, you're the one for me. And she's like, thank goodness, I've been waiting for all these seasons. And it was at that moment that <laughs> Senator John McCain knew that she wasn't <laughs> going to be with Petrovsky <laughs> when she went with her long love. Yeah, correct. <laughs> Joe, this John McCain's got a, he's a real savant. <laughs> He is. He's a real survivor. Um, anyway, so, yeah, so Amy Harris was one of the famous writers, obviously, and she had a joke that the show should be called No Sex in the City because the hours were so long and it was she was often alone and she said it was really hard to date because of that. So um, she said the men that she did try to date during that time tended to fall into two camps, social climbers and men who feared that their foibles would be shared in the writer's room. Oh, not my foibles. foibles. I already said, not my foibles. Um, you would say no. Um, you weren't going to talk about them, and it, of course you were. So, yeah, that's what she said. So that's that. You can credit all of the really touching moments in the film, I think, and the TV series. And one of the reasons why I think it's such an iconic show now and women feel so strongly, or people in general feel so strongly about it, is because of those that team of writers, those women who are talking about their real lives and their real friendships and their real insecurities and also the weird, strange sex things that happened to them while they were dating. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's Sex in the City. Any questions? I guess, like, if I was to watch it from the start now, do you think that I could, I would be, because I don't have the nostalgia for it at all, mm. do you think that I would be like, oh, some of that stuff seems a bit weird? Or would I, do you think I, it's still something you could, like, you know, marathon through and get addicted to? Definitely. Yeah. De- a thousand percent. Yeah, cool. A thousand percent. Because even though that's like, there are spots of it that's problematic, the characters are so funny. It's one of the funniest shows to me. And I think, I mean, James is a massive fan. Oh, great. <laughs> he gets really, because there's also love interests with, like, Carrie, obviously, there's Aiden Shaw. Or like Mr. Big or Petrovsky or like Jack Berger, who she gets broken up with on a post it. <laughs> Jack Berger. Jack, Jack Berger. Berger. They're running out of ideas yeah. in season four. Yeah, exactly. They have some really Looking fun- around the room. Uh, <laughs> there's a hungry Jack's Berger. Yes. Anything in that? <laughs> there's just a lot of really iconic, hilarious writing in it too. Like you really believe the characters and the relationships between them and you get very invested. But also the way they write about sex and sex acts themselves are really, really quite funny. Funny. Um, and so the, the way they typecast some of the men in the stories are really hilarious too. I don't know. I just think you. I think you would get into it. Do you yeah. like rom coms though? Are you into that kind of vibe? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I think yeah. if you like Seinfeld, you'd like this. Great. I reckon it's well because in both shows the fifth <laughs> the character fifth is, is the city. <laughs> the city. I do love Seinfeld. Yeah, well, I do. Th- I mean, it's obviously really different to Seinfeld, but I think the dialogue is just as witty. Like just as great and groundbreaking and still holds up. I think the casting could have been more diverse and all those things. And yeah, some of the storylines are problematic, but really, it's just I think it's one of the best TV shows ever made. I know, which is terrible because obviously it's really problematic in spots. But it was made at a time when women didn't have voices, right, in TV and film often, and their characters were always like sidekicks. And so to have a show about female friendship still feels really exciting and. Not always done. So, yeah. I love it. Great. Shout out to him. We already know that he, you know, Mr. Big is there in the end, so probably don't oh, need yeah, to watch I've it. Oh, yeah, I've spoiled it for you now. I was really hoping yeah. Northern Exposure was going to make it in the end. <laughs> I was hoping for Petrovsky. Petrovsky. <laughs> oh, we lost him. A, he accidentally slapped her. That sounds... <laughs> I don't know how that happens. Anyway, I'm looking forward to finding out. Yeah. 
<laughs> An accidental slap. Oh, no. Well, it's rumoured that Mr. Big dies in the third movie, so maybe Petrovsky will make a comeback. Oh, oh that's great. the only reason he would sign on to do it. Yeah. If you kill him off. Yeah, yeah. that's right. People will stop approaching me in the street because they'll be like, hey, you look a bit like that Mr. Big guy that died. That's a Harrison yeah. Ford type <laughs> yeah. contract with Han Solo. Get me out. Yeah. yeah. I'll come pay, back if pay, I'm out. Pay me big bucks. <laughs> yeah. Correct. Chris North, actually, the actor that plays Mr. Big, had one, got an anecdote that happened in his real life in the show. So apparently when he was dating a famous celebrity, he found it really hard because um, she could always contact him, but he could never contact her. And there's a famous scene, and it's his favourite part in the show, where um, he's complaining to Carrie about how he's dating this woman and he can't contact her even though she can get him. And then he's crying because they've broken up or something, and then he visits her while she's dating someone else, Hayden, in their cabin, and they get into a big mud wrestle, out, <laughs> and it's a big fight. And Chris Knopf is like, yeah, that was my favourite episode. <laughs> the mud wrestle. <laughs> the mud wrestle And one. that bit was based on real life. Yeah, it really happened to him. Yeah, he was really dating, like, a famous <laughs> actress who, like, strung him along and then broke his heart. And then he got in a mud wrestle. Did they, was yeah. the mud wrestle real? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, not with the famous celebrity with, like, Carrie's boyfriend, Aiden. But he yeah. just sounds like a real piece of shit, Mr. Big. <laughs> he's, like, he's stringing Carrie along and then just rocking up yeah. to have a mud wrestle now and then. <laughs> what? Yeah. A, and then going, oh, yeah, I really hate how I'm being strung along in this other relationship while he's clearly doing it to her. Yeah. <laughs> this sounds like a frustrating show to watch. <laughs> it is frustrating, Matthew. <laughs> you really nailed it. Good, Exactly, Matty. But you so love good. it. I do love it. <laughs> love to be frustrated. I think I'm going to love it too. I'm going to wa- I'm going to watch it. I'm going to try and track it down. I reckon right. you should. It's really worth it. It's very funny. There's some very funny scenes. There's one funny scene with Chris North where because he doesn't get very many lines, he has to do all his comedy with his face. And Carrie and him are trying to be friends, and she picks up the jazz man. Who's this guy who plays jazz? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Groundbreaking it. writing. Correct. And they all get a cab home together and Carrie was going to sleep with the jazz, man. And Big, like, shoves himself into the cab with them. But Big usually rides in a limo and never rides cabs. And so Carrie's, like, flirting with the jazz, man, in the back of the cab. He's sitting next to them. And just, like, halfway through while they're flirting, he goes... Cabs are bullshit. <laughs> he's, he's, yeah, that's just more like he's just coming into cock block whenever it's, he's, it sounds like he's got a real I don't want her, but no one else can have her kind of vibe about him. Sounds like a piece of shit. Yeah, Mr. Were... Big, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't done a hashtag on this show for a while, but that's, an, that's probably already been taken, to be honest. But, but you know what? I, I second that motion, man. I think he should have. she should have ended up with Aiden. Oh. He's the Northern Exposure guy. Yeah, he's lovely. He's, 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 not, he's so good in everything. everything. He is. I mean, I haven't, I've seen him in Northern Exposure. Northern Exposure. <laughs> and then in... My uh, big fat wedding. No, I haven't seen that. Oh, but, it's but I've seen the ads for it. <laughs> Which is and I love them. The I loved the ads. <laughs> but I saw him in a in a rom com recently. Maybe I'm amazed or something like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it's and he's the dad in that. And just again, dream boat. Oh, he's always playing a dad. He's so good. In one of the episodes, he um, actually straps on Sarah Jessica Parker's real life baby. Okay. In a scene. When they... a sex show, that could have gone a different way, but. <laughs> <laughs> there is an episode with strap-ons. Okay. But, um, and actually, I didn't say this. The show made famous the rabbit vibrator as well. It, like ran out of like they sold oh. out everywhere. Yeah, so it was super influential. They go, mm. here's a here's a vibrator. Everyone's buying it. Here's a cocktail. Everyone's drinking it. Here are the shoes Jimmy Choo's, and everyone's choosing Jimmy Choo shoes. Oh, yeah. so you, geez, you'd be stoked to. Was Jimmy Choo paying for? Product placement, you know? Is it that kind of thing? I don't know. Possibly. Or maybe not. Because if maybe. it wasn't, you're just, that's just winning the lotto. If, oh, if they've amazing. just chosen your stuff. Oh, yeah. And Manolo Blonix was the other one that big, really Oh, yeah, Manolo. On, yeah, everyone knows Manolo <laughs> Blonix. <Yeah. laughs> Spanish shoes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, thought, I thought it was going to be like a, some sort of a blender. <laughs> now you got the top of the line Manolo Blonix. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That'll whip you up a beautiful smoothie. <laughs> Yeah. Great. Oh, thanks so much for joining us, Claire. That that was fascinating. It's, it's funny how it's a thing that's all around. I think these are often the best episodes where it's a thing that you feel like you kind of know and then you realise you don't know anything about it. Uh, and that's, it's an, that is an interesting tale. Oh, you are welcome. I realised I didn't actually tell you the whole story of the show, but, you know, I are told you, you the in, backstory. Yeah, well, I think maybe maybe we'll do a Patreon bonus episode uh, after Dave watches the series and we'll have you back on and, and we can do like a, a kind of a recap on the series. 
Correct. And then you can decide whether you stand by Matt's hashtag, fuck you, Mr. Big. Yeah. Or fuck off, Mr. Big. <laughs> or not. That would be good. I love to do Maybe that. Maybe I'll be on Team Big. Yeah, you could be. <clears throat> yeah. Who knows? Who's my guy again? You are Cynthia Nixon. No, Aiden Shaw. Aiden Shaw. Aiden Shaw. You're Aiden and uh, your team, Mr. Big. Team I can Big. See that. Team I'm... Big. Go big. Go, go hard. The bigger, the better. <laughs> Uh, nothing surer than Aiden. <laughs> <laughs> Some of that. A couple of teams. We're going yeah, there. Right, there. Twenty we go. years too late. <laughs> <laughs> I really like. That. I wonder who Jess could go for. Maybe burger. Does she like burgers? I feel like she does. She does like burgers. Yeah, she loves she jazz. I've seen her eat a burger before. Yeah, or she might go with the jazz man. <laughs> the jazz. There's also a guy called the Jackrabbit who just has sex like a jackrabbit, like pow 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 pow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, just to let you know. There's options. <laughs> So many options. Carrie had a, you know, she, she, I mean, yeah. six seasons. So in the last season, she dates 28 different men. Wow. How many episodes? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know how is many Is that episodes. one an app or is it? It's more than one an app. More than one she an app. She goes through quite a few. So that's sort of, yeah. that is kind of Jerry Seinfeld sort of levels. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Well, that, there's a lot of the same kind of like Jerry-esque. Not, obviously, they're very different characters. But Jerry and the way he dates, like, and the, and the kind of, like, for instance... Um, Kristen Davis's character who he doesn't date because her toothbrush fell, falls in the toilet and yeah. she brushes her teeth unknowingly. There's a lot of stuff like that with Carrie where she's dating a guy and she's like, nah, a small I'm thing. Out. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's very <laughs> Seinfeld. Yeah, yeah. yeah L- exactly. Like Seinfeld, are you watching a lot going, hmm, I don't think they would be dating him. <laughs> 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 He's so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, possibly. Because, well, Carrie, that's the other thing. She's, she um, has a really different type of look. I mean, I think she's incredibly beautiful, but she's got, like, an unusual face. Oh, as unconventionally what's... attractive. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Whereas Seinfeld she... is unconventionally unattractive. It really is. <laughs> it's an Alistair <laughs> trombley Birchall oh. line. I can't remember what it was in reference oh, to. She's always wearing funny. sneakers with jeans in a weird look. Yeah. Way. Both fashion icons. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we got to do a Seinfeld episode one day. I reckon Alistair would be a great person to have on to do that. Uh, he would know all about it. Oh, yeah, Tom. I saw him in an ad on the television. I watched an ad break recently. Jeez, we're going off track. We should wrap up in a second. But I watched an ad break recently where it was nearly all previous guests of this show. Dave's ad was on. Have you seen Dave's ad? It was like an about accounting or something. I mean, an H and R block. Then there was a Nick yeah, Nick Kappa of Seven Eleven ad, and then there was um, uh, Alice there in a car. It was fun. It was a funny <laughs> ad break. I'm like, huh. <laughs> all my friends. And I, I think I, I was up for at least a couple of those roles. So uh, it's good to see. <laughs> <Yeah. Must've laughs> good the... to see who I've lost out to. <laughs> Must have been the hair colour. Yeah, they just couldn't I think... imagine you <laughs> That's with right. different yeah. hair. <laughs> Jeez, we'd love a brown beard, but Ooh. I can't think of a way of making that happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Anyway, thanks so much for having us, having us, Claire. Thanks so much for being had as well. Uh, oh, lovely. Thanks. <laughs> and if people want to hear more of you, they can check out Taunts. They can. Taunts on all your favourite podcast apps. And um, I have an episode with Jess Perkins, which is really cool. But um, other interviews with people like Jamila Rizvi and Jesse Stevens, um, yeah, Zainab Johnson, who I mentioned. And the most recent episode is an interview about kids and the internet and TikTok. And it's the dark underbelly of TikTok. I had no idea. It's really intense and full. I didn't realise there was a non-dark section of TikTok. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh well, there you go. Now we should swap notes. <laughs> yeah. I need to know about the good stuff about TikTok. Um, anyway, so yeah, there's lots of, yeah, that's, it just goes into that and all the stuff we can do if you have kids and are a bit worried about iPhones and how to cope with all of that tech stuff. And my friend Marty is a cyber safety expert and he goes around talking to schools and kids and parents about all this stuff, and some of the stories are, oh boy, oh, full bet. on, like really full on, but also really important to know about. Anyway, so that's my most recent episode. Thanks for having me, guys. Hey, thank you so much, Claire. What an oh, absolute welcome. privilege. Oh, it was uh, my pleasure. What a privilege to be here with the two of you. <laughs> thank you. Sharing my great American novel. <laughs> Oh, it was been great. such a carry right now. <laughs> he totally is. A Clary. <laughs> a Clary. Oh. <laughs> you definitely are a Miranda because that was very funny, that wordplay. <laughs> very much so. <laughs> 
And now it's time for everyone's favourite part of the show, uh, where we start to thank some of our great supporters. Uh, Claire has just walked out the door. That's coincidental. That's Obviously, a, yeah, one of our greatest supporters. One leaving, of our yeah. greatest supporters. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so to get involved with this, you can go to patreon.com slash dogoonpod or dogoonpod.com. And there's a bunch of different levels you can sign up to with all sorts of different rewards, including bonus episodes. Uh, you know, you get to hear about the t- live shows and tours before everyone else. You get discounts. You get to vote for topics, steer where the show goes. Yeah, and all sorts of things. There's a Facebook group exclusive for our supporters. All sorts of fun stuff. It's a beautiful community. Maybe the most beautiful community. And mm-hmm. I mean that both physically and <laughs> emotionally. Oh, emotion. And uh, mentally. <laughs> yeah. And not their value, but their value. Yeah. Beautiful inside and out. So hot. Just <laughs> it's so a real hot, hot community. <laughs> Uh, and I feel very comfortable being a part of it. Um, <laughs> so so uh, one of the uh, one of the great rewards you get uh, if you support us on the Sydney Schoenberg Deluxe Memorial Edition package level, rest in peace. You can uh, get into this sh- the fact quote or question section. I forgot what it was called. Hey. But I think it's got a little uh, little jingle that goes something like this. Fact quote or question. Ding. Huh, he always remembers the ding. Damn right. And uh, to be involved in this, you just go and you sign up and you get on that level, Sydney Schoenberg level, and then you get to give us a fact, a quote, or a question. You get nearly all the rewards on from that level. Oh, yeah. Um, Big time. And uh, you get to give us the fact, quote, or question. You also get to give us uh, a title for yourself. And the first one this week comes from Nathan Damon, who's given himself the title of Logistics manager in charge of transporting this pod to Perth. Oh, okay. Fantastic. We'd love to get over. I'm actually due to come over to Perth soon if I'm allowed in. <laughs> and uh, has Nathan organised some sort of hovercraft, I imagine? I would hope so. Nathan, you got that hovercraft ready? What sort of logistics is he dealing with you? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, hopefully I'll see you. Uh, tickets still available. I know. I think people have been holding off <laughs> Yeah, yeah. because of uh, COVID reasons. But you can now, you can stop holding off and you can get involved. Um, go to mattstewartcomedy.com and, uh, yeah, click on the appropriate link. <laughs> <laughs> Do go on pod for a discount code. Uh, but anyway, Nathan has given us a fact this week. I don't read these out until I read them out. Okay. Okay, so you're hearing them the first time I'm hearing them. As you say them. As I say them. <laughs> uh, and Nathan's fact is... Dugo on hasn't appeared in Perth since the 3rd of November 2019. We want you back. Oh, and also bring back Listen Now. Oh, and love you guys. Stay safe. Oh, that's interesting. Very serendipitous. Yes, funny that you should say that, Nathan. Because uh, Dave and I, before this episode, we just recorded an episode of Listen Now. Sam, my co-host and co-cousin on the Listen Now podcast, (laughs) is uh, too busy to pod at the moment. (laughs) And she said uh, that I should go on and just do it with fill-in Sam's. And Dave uh, is doing the first couple of episodes at least. I might even be able to twist his arm to do the, the rest of the season. But, I had a great time. I had a great time. Um, so, yeah, check that out. That'll be on your Listen Now feed. Uh, and what was the album we went through? We went through Born in the USA. Uh, Bruce Springsteen's bestseller. Oh, seventh album and some say his most popular. <laughs> <laughs> some. Some say. Uh so, yeah, great fact, Nathan. We are obviously super keen. We had a great time. Dave and I went out for an ice cream after. Possibly even with you, Nathan. There was a little gang we had. Oh, yeah, sorry. I can't remember who was there because I was absolutely <laughs> blind. <laughs> I was embarrassingly drunk, knocking over beers. Oh, dear. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, well, next time, we, that's the real reason we haven't come back to Perth. Shame. I mean, shame, and uh, I've been banned. So, uh, but next time around, we'll, we will not be anywhere yeah. near as uncouth. Yeah, sorry about that, everyone. But we will get the ice cream. Yeah. Um, looking forward to getting back. So hopefully we can organise that before too long. But yeah, obviously there's just some things that have made booking live things in a bit tricky for us lately. Yes. It's hard to get excited about live stuff too, isn't it? Just because if you get excited, you might get disappointed. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> but still, if we put something on sale, please do buy tickets. <laughs> yeah, because it uh, that makes it happen. Um, so thank you very much, Nathan. The next one comes from Victoria Derosha, which I believe this is Victoria's first fact quote or question entry. Welcome to the club, Victoria. Welcome. Uh, and Victoria's title is Lesbian Prime. <laughs> Lesbian Prime. Which is great fun. And uh, <laughs> the uh, 
The question from Victoria goes a little something like this. Hello, all, and sorrow, sorry if I'm lacking... Oh, my God. The irony of me not reading this very well. Hello, all, and sorry if my English is lacking. <laughs> I recently started listening to your podcast and I'm currently working my way through the backlog, and I'm having a great time. Thank you for feeding my passion for useless knowledge. <laughs> uh, well, obviously, this episode didn't have any of that. This is all very uh, important Oh, my goodness. We don't know this stuff. Uh, Victoria goes on to say, Anyway, here's my question. If you could live in any country in the world, where would you live? I'd go for Norway for the beauty and the calm. Lots of love from France. Oh, so Victoria's in France. Okay. Thanks so much for... Uh... Big fan of France. Had a great time um, traveling through France a few years back. Really loved... Um, I was, it was one of the periods where I was solo traveling for a couple of weeks through Europe back in the day. Kicked off your tour. Yeah, and I just had a, had a really nice time. I, I can't remember a single cloud in the sky the whole time I was in France. It was just like a beautiful blue sky. Were you burnt to a crisp? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been smashing through a lot of French TV shows lately. Watched all five seasons. He's of the... actually Belgian. I'll, I'll put you up there. <laughs> no, I watched all five seasons of uh, The Bureau or Le Bureau de Legend or something like that it's called. Uh, then Lupin. Uh, call me by your agent. Call me no. Call my agent. I always confuse that with call me by your name. Call me by your agent. <laughs> um, this is lost in translation. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Call my agent. Um, yes, I'm loving uh, all the stuff. Obviously, is set in France too. So I've got to get over that. Beautiful country. Such a such a rich history. Oh, absolutely. But is that the place that you'd live? Uh, I mean, it's it's the first one that came to mind uh, when Victoria said she was from France. <laughs> I think New Zealand's a place I'd love to live. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Canada, America, North America. I like. I'd love to live anywhere, really. Yeah. I do have a dream of living in NYC, okay. <laughs> which is what it's a little nickname I have for New York City. Oh, I didn't yeah. get that. I was like Nike. <laughs> um, I I don't know. Maybe Spain for me. Love uh, Spanish food, weather, paella. Oh yeah, I love that Barcelona. <laughs> oh, great city. Uh, yeah, love, the, love, love the architectural work love of that. Gaudi. Oh, Gaudi. <laughs> um, yeah. Or that, yeah. Or Catalonia. Love that area. Um, but, yeah, I mean, Iceland, the most beautiful country I've ever been to, but I don't know if I could face the cold, right. cold spells. I'd love to visit Iceland for sure. But, uh, yeah, li- living somewhere else. Following one of Poirot's uh, jaunts. Oh, over to Mesopotamia. Yeah. Fantastic. Modern day Iraq. Iraq. Yeah, um, or I had a great time when we were in Dublin. It was very oh, beautiful. Oh, fantastic. I mean, if you're worried about the cold, that might hit you a I bit. I know. That's well. why I'm thinking that Spain might be the one for me. And also I love their culture of getting up later, staying out later. You're the I'm one not a morning person. Pre-COVID, you were really keen to get over to Africa, which is obviously <laughs> many countries. but um, 54, I believe. 54 countries. Is there, is there still plans... To get over there? Yes, it's still on my ultimate bucket list. What, 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 any country in particular? Yeah, I'd love to go to uh, Southern Africa and go on safari in like a Namibia. Yep. And then, so I, I was hoping to do a tour from South Africa up the West Coast through Namibia and then east through Botswana and then finishing up sort of around Victoria Falls. I'm really keen to tag along if we can make it happen. Okay, let's make it happen once they open these, these goddamn borders. Yeah, fantastic. Great question. Oh, man, I love dreaming of traveling. Just yeah. Cause it, it's, it's something, it's one of my favorite things to do and we just have not been able to do it really at all, certainly internationally. Um, but, yeah, thank you for letting me dream there, Victoria. Uh, the next one comes from Ben Johnson. Uh, ben Johnson, who uh, we've met a few times all over the world. That's right, in cold climate and also warm climate. That's right. We was at the... Uh, the Thailand Podcast Festival. All right, in Coast Movie, that was a great time in the pool. <laughs> I can uh, <laughs> honestly, I think about that trip a lot. Yeah. Like, thinking about, you know, now we can't travel at all. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, that didn't appreciate as much as I could. I'm really going to, uh, every time I see Carl, who's the, the patron of the festival, I've got to just say, hey, Carl, just, if, you know, if it ever does happen again. Yeah, no, we, <laughs> yeah, no, no. Just keep I reckon us in you mind. can twist our arm to yeah, come yeah, back. Yeah, we consider it. <laughs> um, so Ben has given himself the title Ben J from MK, 
<laughs> Milton a, Keynes. Milton Keynes, which he, he calls out an homage to oh. Gary J from, <laughs> Gary Gary from UK. That's great. Ben J from MK. And Ben's offered us a fact, and his fact is sort of a fact slash trivia question. Oh, we'll we'll Dave, you'll be all over this. Do you know whether Stephen Hawking went to Oxford or Cambridge University? It says pause for others to answer. Oh, okay. Is it one of those things where it's he went to both? Oh, okay. Is that, is that your answer? Maybe. Yep. Well, you are correct. <laughs> oh, nice try, Ben. I mean, you cannot sorry, Ben, but he is often pointed to as the smartest man in history, so you can see why he, you know, you'd let him in. You'd let him in, right? Says uh, uh, both. Hawking went to Oxford University to study physics and chemistry, then went to Cambridge to continue studying cosmology. Which is how to make, uh, how to mix Cosmo. <laughs> Cosmo. <laughs> Co- Cosmo uh, cocktails. And he was pretty good at it. Yeah. <laughs> great fact. That's a great fact. I, that is. That's so funny. I would have, I mean, just because he asked it, there was, there was that a made me in think, there. Yep. But I didn't, I didn't gotten onto it until you <laughs> said it. I'm like, that sounds right. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Ben. And finally this week, I would love to uh, thank and ask uh, not ask, ask for forgiveness. I'd, I'd love to thank and ask for forgiveness from Julian Barnes, who is the self-appointed reference for if a fact is sexy. Oh, okay. Because I've obviously got dull facts. Jess has got fun facts. I've got grim facts. Matt's got grim facts. And now Julian's got sexy facts. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I wonder if that'll uh, come up here from Julian. Uh, he's offered a fact. He writes, Hey, once again, I've completely failed to come up with my own facts. So I've grabbed a, a juice off the production line and taken off the cap. Well, if you recall, uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's how Julian gets his facts. He gets little, oh the little, little facts. facts. That's right. On the Aussie juices, there that a fact inside the lid. Yeah, is it Goulburn Valley juice? Maybe. Yeah. Is it? Anyway. Anyway, uh, the ones with the glass bottles. This is a little fact number one hundred and ninety-six. Male monkeys lose their hair on their heads in the same way men do. <laughs> he says, "I don't know if that's true." But I do know that it's not sexy. <laughs> <laughs> You're not casting aspersions over the little facts. Yeah, sure. Truthfulness. Come on, mate. Um, no, that, that's definitely, that, that sounds right. Male monkey pattern baldness. That's right. Um, do they have the human life crisis? <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you so much to Julian, Ben, Victoria and Nathan for their facts and their questions. No quotes this week. Or brags. Or brags. Yeah, that's right. Um, you can now offer a brag as well. So to get involved in this, like I said, get on the Sydney Scheinberg level. And once you sign up, you get a link to um, add in a fact quote or question or brag. And <laughs> yeah, if you're in that level and you haven't had one for a while, get them in there. We've only got uh, enough to get through another another week or two, I reckon. So if, you, if you've got one, you've got a burning brag or other. Yeah, get it in. Get it in. Uh, what we also like to do is thank a few of our other great Patreon supporters. We normally have a little game that Jess comes up with, but in her absence, Dave, do you, do you have any ideas? All right. So we're talking about Sex and the City. Obviously, I'm fascinated with Mr. Big. <laughs> That's a great name. <laughs> what about we I'm give... I'm the one who wants to be with you. <laughs> yeah. We want to give the characters... Um, no, sorry, the supporters their version of Mr. Big. Oh, okay. Miss Big. Sir something. Is it all size-based? Or it could be anything. Oh, that could be cool if it was size based. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Medium. <laughs> <laughs> you wasted a great one. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll I'll read out five. How about that? And you give them names and then you read out five and I'll give them names. So I'm I'm giving you dibs on the first five sizes. Okay. <laughs> which I regret instantly. Why did I do that? <laughs> All right, so first up, I'd love to thank from West End in Queensland, Anne Penny. Anne Penny. All right, Anne. I'm going to give you. What about Ms. <laughs> I'm absolutely blanked. Ms. Massive. That's good. Ms. Massive. <laughs> Ms. Massive. Love that. <laughs> Anne Penny, aka Miss Massive. Ms. Massive. Uh, I'd also love to thank from Melbourne, Victoria. Ever heard Ooh, of it? Oh, yes. In Australia. Shelby Seddon. Geez, we're off to a hot start with names this week. Shelby. Is that a Miz or a Mr. Off the Shelby, I, I, we used to have a refrigeration mechanic back when I was selling air conditioning. And uh, that was a man named Shelby. 
Okay, so I'll give both just in case. Mr. or Miss Immense. Immense. <laughs> Mr. Oh, Immense. That's very good. Um, I think that's fantastic. Shelby, you've got to be happy with that. Shelby Seddon. I mean, you were absolutely kissed on the dick <laughs> when you were named at birth or otherwise. <laughs> Um, is, that, is, that, is that is a that, well-known phrase? I've never heard of it. Okay. <laughs> I think that you could claim it. No, that's, that's not one, that's not one of mine. One of yours? Is that Shelby, your means, refrigerator mechanic? It means uh, blessed, very lucky. Right. I don't know why yet. I've never thought about it. That's just one, that's just sort of like a not eat a fuck spiders kind of. Yeah. Doesn't really bit. make sense. But How often was your fridge breaking down to have the, your your family's own r- refrigerator mechanic oh no that, that when i was working in in air conditioning oh okay it was an install growing up and i'm like you think that i'm in the affluent east <laughs> yeah. you laugh about a butler's pantry you have your an entire you've got a staff oh, yeah. of refrigerator yeah. repair yeah out, oh, out in the manor yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah for sure <laughs> um i'd also love to thank from auckland in new zealand uh jenny stringleman oh jenny stringleman what about ms King size. Ms. King size. Love that. Very good indeed. Jenny Stringleman. Another fan. That's three for three great names. Can we keep this run going? I okay. doubt it. What are the, it couldn't possibly. But let's try. And I'd love to thank from Brisbane in Queensland, Australia. It's Sarah Cushert. Oh, my God. We did it again. <laughs> oh, Sarah, Sarah Cushert. Cushert. What about Ms. Minute? Ms. Minute. <laughs> we, we were going for all... Alliterative sort of yeah, style. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. We're having fun here. Okay. You are definitely using them all then. How many M ones can there be? I know. How many can there be? Uh, and finally for me, I'd love to thank from Mullingar in Westmeath in Ireland. IE is a country, is that? That's Ireland, I'm pretty sure. Usually. Alan Coyle. Very Irish Alan name. Co- Coyle. Mr. Microscopic. <laughs> <laughs> Al, uh, you'd be happy with that, Alan. Mr. Microscopic. Sure. Sort of Ant, Ant-Man's adversary. <laughs> Damn you, Mr. Microscopic. <laughs> All right. I'm going to throw it over to you, Dave. And Dave, can I ask, did you have some sort of help there? Surely not. Yes, I did have the, the thesaurus open for big and small. <laughs> so feel free to... Uh, to uh, Copy me there. I would like to thank, first up, from Tulsa in Oklahoma, that is Jeanette Newton. Jeanette Newton, uh, a.k.a. <laughs> Lady Length. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That is great. Jeanette Newton, Lady Length. That sounds like a discount superhero. <laughs> yeah, it really does. Instead of, instead of like Stretch Armstrong. Stretch Armstrong, the invisible woman. Lady Length is here. Okay. Uh, but Jeanette, I love it. I would love to thank now from Des Moines. Oh, someone had to be. Huh? The <laughs> famous Bill Bryson line. I come from Des Moines, Iowa. Someone, <laughs> someone had to. You know who else comes from there? Michael Schiller. Michael Schiller. Uh, Michael Schiller, Count Capacity. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything? I've that, gone away great. from these. Are these not sizes this anymore? This is better. This is even better. Michael Schiller, or Killer. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank from Dublin in Ireland. A few Irish people this week. I'd like to thank Robin Blakey. Robin Blakey. I would <laughs> love to. Uh, Thank Sir Stature. <laughs> Sir Stature. <laughs> so, yeah, I think <laughs> that's, I don't know, what is that? That kind of makes you think of like a knight in armour, right? Sir Stature. <laughs> yeah. I'd be trusting Sir Stature with my life. And I would like to thank uh, from an unknown location. I can only imagine it's deep within the fortress of the moles. Ruth Luxford. Ruth Luxford. Uh the Honourable, <laughs> it doesn't work. H's have such inconsistent sounds. Honourable Highness. <laughs> Honourable Highness. Technically, it's alliteration, technically. <laughs> technically, look, if it works written down. What about what about Honourable Height? Okay. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey. Honourable Huge. Honourable Huge. <laughs> I think that's it. You can choose. Or that. honorable huge. Honorable huge. <laughs> like, yeah, like Donald Trump says, huge. huge. It was huge. Honorable huge. Honorable huge. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. 
Nice one, Ruth. Shout out to the other fortress of the mole dwellers. And finally, I'd like to thank from Texas, uh, specifically in North Richland Hills, it's DJ McMillan. DJ McMillan. Is that really? <laughs> yeah, is there, is there a D one you can come up with? DJ something? DJ... Uh, DJ Diameter. <laughs> <laughs> DJ Diameter on the decks. <laughs> well, at l- I love it. Uh, Dave, like I often think, as long as we're having fun. <laughs> right? Right? Right, everyone? Anyone out there? So I'd love to love to thank once again, what a fantastic batch of names there. We had DJ, Ruth, Robin, Michael, Jeanette, Alan, Sarah, Jenny, Shelby and Anne. Uh, welcome uh, to the what are the size size gang? <laughs> so it's all real home brand. Yeah, right, we're size kings and queens here. <laughs> uh, but the other thing we like to do before we uh, close out the show is welcome in a few people near the Triptych Club. Now, uh, the way you get involved in this is to be uh, supporting us on the shout out level or above for three straight years. Then you get welcomed into the Triptych Club. I'm standing on the door. I've got the velvet rope ready to lift it up. I've got your name on the list. Oh, yeah. I'll read it out. Then Dave, he'll hype you up when you come in. And then I'll, because Jess isn't here, I'll, I'll give Dave a little little fluff, a little tickle um, on the way through. Cause Thank it's, you so much. It's a, it's, a, it's a lot of work to, um, to, to really big people up. And uh, Dave, you've normally booked a band. Often semi-relevant to the episode topic. Well, I did just see a list of uh, guest stars in Sex and the City, and I saw none other than Ginger Spice herself, wow. Jerry Halliwell, who's coming out to perform all her solo hits. <laughs> okay, can you name any? Uh, <laughs> yep, yeah, uh, just give me a second. Halliwell songs. While you're looking that up, I'll say, because Jess normally has a little cocktail. And it's Raining be... Man. Oh, yeah. The one cover. Of, one of her big ones. Yeah. Obviously, there'll be Cosmos on the bar all night tonight, as well as all the other drinks that Jess has put together in previous weeks. Um, is there anything else we need to say here before we start bringing them in? Well, normally, so this is, a, if you want to know the physical address of this place, it does exist in our hearts, but also it moves around physically. Where is it this week? Uh, the tallest skyscraper in New York City. <laughs> Currently unsure. Yeah, uh, it's so tall they haven't named it yet. Wow, that's tall. All right, so there's four inductees this week. You ready to go, Dave? You ready to hype them in? All right, here we go. Here we go. So, uh, come in, grab yourself a Cosmo, get ready for a bit of Jerry Halliwell from <laughs> Greenville in South Carolina in the United States. It's Ted Sanders. Oh, I thought this night was dead, but you know what? It's Ted. <laughs> as in great. <laughs> yes, Dave. Thank you. Ted is in great. Love that. I get it. And from Kawasaki in Japan, it's Afka F.A. Oh, this night ain't going to Kawasaki. Yes, Yes, Dave, thank you. It's... The pause is very... I thought, well, like... I, I, was, well, I, thought you, I thought you were halfway through, but that's how good it was. Kawasaki. It sounds like Kawasaki. Very cool to have someone from Japan in the, in the club. Thank you so much. Uh, from Jersey City, New Jersey, home of the boss... In the United <laughs> States, it's Anastasia Sabo Chick. Oh, this night, uh, it's become a bit of a fantasia for the senses. Yes, Dave, he's done it again. <laughs> and finally, from City in Great Britain. <laughs> Which one? Which <laughs> one? It's Tom Horton. Horton, we're not going to be Borton tonight. We're going to have a great time. <laughs> yes, Dave. <laughs> Horton is a hoo. Yeah. I don't know what that means. Horton is a hoot. Horton is a hoot. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you so much, Tom, Anastasia, Afka, and Ted. Welcome into the club. Make yourselves at home. And yeah, just enjoy the tune. Just enjoy, enjoy the tune. Enjoy the tune That's of right. Jerry Men over and over again. It's Homer Simpson's favorite song, so. And it's also your wedding song, Dave. That's right. It's raining, man. <laughs> it's raining, man. And, uh, yeah, I guess it's time to boot at home. Dave, anything else to say before we go? Uh, n- no, I think we're all, we're, all, we're all done here. Thank we you sh- so much, everyone. Should have uh, Jess Bot Perkins back next week. Uh, looking forward to that. It will be my report. And I'm, yeah, looking forward to getting... Uh, Really getting the uh, the chalkboard out and really Ooh, le- this, t- learning some lessons. This might be a free choice for you, is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, I hope so. If it is, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> well, maybe it's a free choice for me actually coming up. Sorry to what a uh, tease. disappoint you there. What a cool you know what? Tease. I'm going to do the topic that you were going to do. What? With my no. free choice. <laughs> anyway, uh, find us at Do Go On Pod on all the things, website, a Gmail address, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, etc. All those links are in the show notes anyway. 
Um, hopefully we'll catch you again next week. Hey, tell your friends and why not uh, give us a review if you if you've listened for a while and you like it. Chuck us a review on on your app of choice. Yeah, that always helps. It's nice. And yeah, well, tell a friend. Both things are, uh, help help get get us out and about. <laughs> All right, Dave, better at home. Thank you so much for listening. And until next week, I'll say thank you and goodbye. Laters. You know, the, speaking of science loves for your feet, some speaking shoe on. shops decades ago used to have a special machine that would x-ray your foot through the shoe what <gasps> yeah what? No, to I show you that. where it was yeah what, show you where your foot the was shoe? yeah so you could see it was better than wiggling your toe they'd be like hang on let me just pull out this small x-ray machine yeah, like, there it is it's right there in your shoe <laughs> it may affect your future fertility <laughs> yeah, I think at least that they we'll know your shoes fit <laughs> worked out that sort of stuff and uh, really pulled those from the market <laughs> <laughs> isn't that a strange <laughs> that is strange crazy. strange part of shoe history I would have loved that go. though thanks Dave actually last time I went to get runners I went to a particular shoe shop and I had to walk along this like conveyor belt thing the guy was like right Take your shoes off. Bare oh. feet, please. And then you have to walk. And then they showed you in like 3D yeah. how your feet move. Wow. Yeah, like the pressure and stuff. I did yeah. that one as well. Yeah. yeah. God, what are these fancy shoe shops you're visiting? It's very weird. I'd still, it was like a catwalk. I had to like yeah. walk all the way along. Oh, I'm just going to Victorian era ones where they just uh, x-ray me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're going in for a pair of Reeboks coming out with a hairline fracture. <laughs> 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 So it's a podcast about the Little Mermaid. Is that right? <laughs> I'm really not explained it very well. <laughs> and tonsillitis. I had tonsillitis. Well, that's correct. why she couldn't exactly. talk. Yeah, correct. Correct. <sighs> that would Ariel. be tricky having people with tonsillitis on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> It's not the right medium for him, I don't think. No, well, she did lose her voice, didn't she? So I was like, yeah, there you like, go. Lost your it's voice. a show where I interview mermaids who've <laughs> lost their voice due to tonsillitis. And we just unpack how they feel, except there's not much talking. I do all of it because she can't, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> say I'll do the talking here. <laughs> Correct. Exactly. I'll answer the and you've got a question here? I have. It's very long. <laughs> no, I love that. Well, just you haven't to really. Start off. Got into Jess's shoes that well. She normally forgets yeah, the right Jess question. Yeah, Jess wouldn't write a question. Oh, no. Oh, no. That was the first thing I did. Excellent. I'm already starting to I mean, the, those shoes. The fa- I'd be still typing on the report until about this point. So the fact that you've printed <laughs> it out yeah. shows a real Look, confidence. I'm if, if nothing if not thorough. I'll give you is a one. Is one of those ones. Is it, uh, what was that one that they try to get a desserts one happening here? It was a spin-off from MasterChef. Oh, Zumbo's. Was, is it Zumbo's <laughs> what? dessert? I know what you're talking about. MasterChef. Well, it's really... No, you are all wrong. They call, is it, is it Zumbo related? No. <laughs> what, what's Zumbo? Really Zumbo like... was one of the chefs. He and he had a... Oh, okay. Right. That makes that makes sense. I, I thought they'd just come up with a, a new concept. It's like, just call it Master Dessert or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's like really... Zumba. It's a mix between exercise and, and baking. <laughs> they just throw macaroons at each other in a room. And the, and city. the city. On the city. On the city. <laughs> All right. Around no. the city. Now you're talking. Yeah, no, that was that was uh, King Kong was heading that way, sex on the city. On the city. Is oh, that what he was going for? Yeah, what? when he climbed up that big building. Oh, God. <laughs> well, that's how, that was my interpretation. <laughs> That was, I've never heard that before, that innuendo about King Kong climbing up a big, tall building. Yeah, well, Jeez. big phallic. There's... Very symbolic there. Oh, yeah. I was talking to people oh, about yeah. Star Wars recently, and one, and the guy was saying, because I, and I shouldn't start this, because there'll be people from each side listening, I'm sure, but the, I'm like, I really like the, uh, the one with, uh, I can't remember what it's called. The lightsabers. The second most recent one. There was this scene with red sand. It's all I can remember. But yes. it was real cool. Oh, my God. And I'm like, I, I know so Star Wars fans hate this. And, and the guy I was talking to was like, no, no, some, half of us hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. But then the other half uh, love the next one and hate that one. And I'm like, that's... Yeah. I, we, I'll probably will edit this out because I don't want to start any trouble. <laughs> yeah, but that red sand really... scene was pretty sick. It was bloody awesome. Memory. James and I are definitely in the red sand camp. Okay, yeah, there you go. Skywalker walks out and it's like bloody awesome. Side note, um, James was telling me that um, the guy who plays Luke Skywalker and his name is... Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill came up with a whole lot of ideas for the movie, <laughs> one of which was that he, in that scene, could be a giant version of himself because he projects himself so he could just be giant and step on everybody. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> I love so, that. James, if, if people 